Hi. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. How is it? Hello. Oh, I want to see energy Hello. in the room today. This is not a webinar, a lot of energies today. Oh, Oliver, how are you doing from Delta? It's good to see you. Is Hi. Thank you. Likewise. First time that we have you, we cannot have a meeting on hyperspectral imaging if Oliver Post is not there. Then it's not a real meeting on hyperspectral imaging. <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> Everyone is here. Let's get the ball rolling. Everyone here in the room and in the YouTube universe, welcome. Welcome to the epic Thank meeting you. on hyperspectral imaging. My name is Jose, Jose Pozo from EPIC, and today is the number 13 of the online technology meetings. We, we actually came up with the idea of being totally crazy and organized 31 meetings in 10 weeks. And so far, we are almost halfway, and we are receiving so much positive feedback that this is not, it's just the beginning of something that is going to last for forever. I am so happy that we have the, 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 the support of 500 companies, but I'm even happier that I am uh, today representing a dream team of people. A dream team with uh, Carlos, all of you know, the rock star of Epic, but also with people with technology background, with people who are events managers and who are marketing managers. And you don't know how much work there is behind the scenes. So I'm here, Francesca is here, we're having a lot of fun. There is so much effort that these people are putting behind the scenes that like, I wanted to give them a little bit of a tribute today. At the end of the day, all of us, all of us at Epic, we are now, when I started, it was only Carlos, but all of us together, we are uh, 12 to 14 people. Uh, we focus on three, on four things. We focus on organizing events. We are not an event organizer. We are looking for partner suppliers and customers of the 552 members of Epic. We organize market data. So we talk to market analysts and we get you the best market reports that we can find. We connect you. So basically, all of you, please, if you are looking for any partner, supplier, customer of any technology, then let us know. We'll make the connection. And I think many of you already have experienced that. Unfortunately, we cannot disclose what we do, but all of you know how strong we are connecting the industry. And finally, if you're looking for investment, either investing or raising capital, for that you need to contact Carlos. Carlos is now fully focused on helping the EPIC members raise the money they need to satisfy their dreams. And today I'm here on behalf of the technical team. We have four technical people who are raising stars of this industry. Today Francesca is with us, but all of you who have followed this uh, events know Sana, uh, she's a specialist on optics, know Elena, she's a specialist on medical technologies, and know Anna, all of you all know Anna very well, she's our pilot line manufacturing for photonic internet circuit person. And we have can announce that we have hired a person with 30 years experience in the laser industry, Antonio Raspa. He's going to be the one guiding these four racing stars in the world of the industrial connection. And with the events, I just would like to remind you that when the whole thing goes back to normal, if ever, uh, we are having now already planned great events for the upcoming year and we already have for example an event at nanoscribe with micro optics we are going to have an event at north so hyperspectral imaging we're going to have an event on automation for manufacturing at pi we're going to have an event at 3d printing at siemens uh, we also eventually are going to be uh, philips talking about medical device manufacturing so we already are planning the events when and if the situation goes back to normal and we keep buying market reports for you so all of you who are epic members please make sure that you go to the extranet and download the market report use them abuse them we spend a lot of money on them remember that we just bought the worldwide market for lasers from strategies unlimited it's the best market report you can find on lasers in the industry so please have a look at it read it and if you have comments i am very much in touch with the market analysts themselves so i can pass your feedback to them and use it to negotiate better in the future so give us the feedback and with this one final thing which is that we are extremely proud that we have now the biggest job for photonic people hunting in the industry www.jobsinphotonics.com so if you are either looking to satisfy the job openings of your company or thinking about helping your colleagues with career moves this is the website to go, jobsinphotonics.com. We are actively scouting the job openings of the 552 members of EPIC and putting them in the website and promoting that into the different talent recruitment offices. And that's all I have to say, because this is the agenda for today. 
We talk about hyperspectral imaging, so now your, talk, your turn to speak. But before that, I would like to have a review of the supply chain, and there is no better person in the whole universe than my colleague Francesca Moglia to present the supply chain of today's meeting. Francesca, what's in the menu today? So thank you very much, Jose. Welcome also from my side. So hyperspectral imaging at the moment is like a really interesting and, and hot topic. So that's why we, we hope to interest a lot of end users. So that's why here we will have a, 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 a talk from, from C, uh, CQS, CQSO. <laughs> and so from Fred, that we talk about a possible application in agriculture. But also we, we hope we can interest all these kind of end users like for consumer electronics, for semicoms, so Huawei a, a, as a group and, and Sumitama Electronic Lightwave. Uh, automo automotive, of course, and then medical application. These are a bit just in a, a bit of what is possible for hyperspectral imaging. Also, uh, we will hear today from um, one of our Horizon 2020 funded projects, multiple, that has actually three different uh, uh, applications uh, that can be also very interesting for hyperspectral imaging. And then, of course, we, we have to talk with the, with the supply chain. So, and, and as you see here, there is really a lot that, that is going on and that is needed actually for epispectral imaging. So first of all, cameras, so of course, camera manufacturers. So here we have uh, IMIC, Xenix and Lambda X that today with Iris also will, will speak about uh, their contribution and, and what is expected from them and what they expect from us as well, from all the audience here and from the end users as well. But then also others, of course, like uh, Yenoptic and IT. But then, of course, we need also for small cameras, micro-optics. So that's why we have here also some representative from Swiss micro-optics, for example, that are really interested in how to implement their optics there. Then, of course, R&D and all the, the institutions that are also committed to, to cameras and to developing hyperspectral imaging, like VTT. And then filters, of course, as we said, we cannot, uh, we cannot forget that also very important part is filters and coatings for this. So we will have a talk from Oliver from Delta, and then also all the uh, Hoya, Akhtar, and all these uh, coatings and, and office representatives are here, really keen uh, on, on speaking with us. So optic vultures and spectrogon as well. So I see there is a lot of attention in this, uh, in this direction. Then of course, fibers, because we can also implement it with fibers, this system. So uh, NKT photonics and also the general development of hyperspectral imaging is there. So we will have also from Ross a contribution today. And then all the other detectors and integrated photonics is really needed. System integration, of course, the system integrators are really keen on, on learning today. Metrology, because it's anyway a testing mode that hyperspectral imaging is using. And then uh, corning and our experts, so market data. So we will hear also from Ineca today. But before announcing her, let's go back. I give the word back to Jose. Yes, two things. <laughs> I, keep, I keep receiving emails about people telling me, Jose, you forgot my company in your slide. <laughs> this slide represents the company who registered for this meeting. So you want to be in the upcoming meetings, remember, go to epictasasoc.com and register your company for that meeting, and then you will be in the slide. Please, please don't complain because my little heart is suffering every time you tell me that I forgot anyone. I don't forget any of these 552 companies. I also would like to say hello to the people in YouTube. So if you have any question or most important, if you want to connect with any of the participants today, Yes, you have to send me an email, jose.poto at epic-asoc.com, jose.poto at epic-asoc.com. I will make sure that you get introduced to the participant. This is valid for the people in YouTube as well as for the people in the Zoom meeting. If you want to connect with any other the participants, just let me know the purpose of this meeting is to make connections. It is not a webinar, it is a business generation opportunity. And to talk about the business of hyperspectral imaging, there is nobody better than Eneka. Eneka I know her for so many years, we've been talking about so many things in the past, but she is very well connected to the agriculture sector. And she's been one of the people who's pushing photonics towards agriculture. She told me, I really want to speak about your meeting of hyperspectral imaging. And Eka, thank you very much for being with You're us welcome. this afternoon. The floor and the attention of everyone is yours. Thank you. So, uh, I'm doing the talk, are you okay? Mm. Sorry for that. No problem. You, yes. Okay. So let me introduce myself first. I'm uh, Dr. Eneka Idiar Barsou. So, as mentioned, uh, Jose, I'm the CEO of uh, Eneka Consulting. I'm based in France, uh, south of Paris, and all my activities are based on photonics technology. 
and especially in innovation. So you can find my coordinates there. Sorry, I have a problem <laughs> with my presentation. Uh, I cannot move my slide. I'm use sorry. The, use the space bar. This is always normally works. No, it doesn't work. Yes, use double click and then a space bar. Ah, yes. Thank you. So my biography, I'm a doctor in laser physics from uh, the University Pierre and Marie Curie in Paris. And I've got uh, 25 years experience in photonics industry, mainly in research and development and uh, in new business development. I worked 10 years in telecom industry, developing some optical com components, uh, both in uh, orange and corning. And then I moved to uh, 10 years dur um, during 10 years in defense and security industry, where I was developing some uh, laser systems for defense and security. After that, I moved to uh, new business development in Thales uh, to grow up a business in uh, large instruments. And my last uh, industrial experience is uh, in automotive with Valeo, where I was responsible for all the collaborative innovation in the visibility business group. During that time, I conducted as well uh, a roadmap in France for mobility in order to, to present it to the French Ministry of Economy. So uh, for five years now, I have experience on innovation support. Uh, first, I, uh, I was uh, responsible for the CNRS portfolio patents in photonics and optics. Uh, I was as well the head of innovation in the French cluster near Paris Optics Valley that now join Systematic. And so for three years now, I'm consulting uh, in innovation based on photonics technology. Some references are Orange, Corning, Alcatel, Siemens, Airbus, Thales, Valeo, Sanofi, Schneider Electric, Nest, L'Oréal, and some activities as well in research on platforms like uh, Alphanov um, for DGA, CEA, and uh, of course, the European uh, organization Photonics 21, EPIC, which I'm a member, <laughs> and Photonics France. So what I'm... Uh, providing as a service for private companies. I'm doing some uh, innovation strategy and funding. I'm setting and leading uh, collaborative projects. I'm uh, bringing some photonics technology expertise and scouting and technology transfer. To academic research laboratories, I can uh, set some collaborative projects and, I, and help to, to find some uh, industrial partners technology transfer and research valorization. It means uh, patent and technological platform valorization. And to organizations, uh, I help them to build uh, full innovative solutions, uh, both uh, technological, organizational, and social innovations to meet societal challenges. In particular, um, I'm, uh, I have some partnership with uh, Living Lab um, that have some uh, uh, human sciences uh, resources. So all of this is my activities. So especially in uh, hyperspectral uh, imaging, uh, as mentioned, uh, uh, Jose, I, I have some, uh, I have a, a very good contact um, with an expert in Onera, that is the, the French Aerospace Lab. Uh, that's the, the best, uh, <laughs> the best one in France in hyperspectral imaging. And I had some activities already in uh, new space and agriculture, uh, as mentioned, uh, Jose. And uh, as well, I'm looking to industry 4.0 and uh, in earth, in uh, uh, hyperspectral imaging. But uh, that's uh, really at the beginning of my business. So uh, I didn't do any presentation on that. But I know uh, all the company after me will do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eneka, and thank you for opening the show. The, 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 the reason why we really wanted you to be in the, in the forum today is because the market for, um, for her spectral imaging has a lot of uncertainties, a lot of unknowns. We have, it's not a new technology, we have seen it growing, but as many of the companies are going to tell you later, uh, there is different demands from different application sectors. We have also a user from the agriculture. If I can ask you, what have you seen in the last years uh, in the development of her spectral imaging for agriculture that is for you resonating and you think is a good opportunity for the companies today? Uh, well, that's a great question. <laughs> I did not prepare that one. Um, 
Well, I, I haven't any, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I cannot bring you any, any insight on that. We are gonna, no, don't worry, because we, we need to discuss this. At the end of the day, one of the things that uh, I've been uh, meeting Oliver Pors in different parts of the world on the last four years, every week in a different conference, and we were always talking about, about this market. Oliver, uh, you have been one of the biggest advocators in Europe to bring hyperspectral imaging for new markets. What have you seen in the last two, three years that shows us that this community is going in the right direction? It's uh, it's definitely the interest level that we experience when we have contacts with customers and potential customers. Um, I mean, hyperspectral imaging, you know, is it's it's not really new technology, but it's only in the recent years that technology has become available that brings it to broader markets, not necessarily mass markets, but industrial volume applications. And there uh, we we see very different um, industries that have an interest in hyperspectral imaging from medical applications, agricultural uh, applications, satellite imaging. Um, it's, it's really it's too broad to, to give a comprehensive overview, um, but it's still on, on the level where many, many people are interested, but the, uh, to bring it really out into the industrial application, that's I think the big task uh, for the coming years uh, to really make products uh, that customers can use uh, where they not get a very nice for the technically interested person, very nice uh, camera, but also get software that enables their, uh, the customer's applications. So I've been talking to you in different forums. We always, uh, we always discuss the same things with the audience. For me, uh, what I have learned so far is that there are three challenges. We have the cost, the complexity, and the data, the data challenge in terms of data processing and the data storage. Every pixel is a spectrometer, so it collects so much data. I want to talk, I want to look at Javil Optics because Javil is the company that we have in Epic enabling camera manufacturers ramping up to volume production. Simon is here from, from Javil. Hello, Simon, how are you doing this afternoon? Hi, Jose, how are you doing? How is the weather in Jena today? Most it's important. quite sunny, as you, so, as you can see in my background. <laughs> so I want people here, we have lots of different camera manufacturers and component suppliers. Uh, how do you position Javil in this supply chain and what can you do for the others and the others can do for you? Well, if you if you look at uh, Javil in terms of uh, cameras, it's mostly consumer cameras. So uh, extremely high volume for mobile phone applications and other portable devices. And uh, to be frank, uh, I'm interested in uh, getting some insight on these uh, hyperspectral imaging and cameras, uh, not only on the camera side, but also on the illumination side to see uh, and evaluate market potential also for, for Jabil. We do not consider this as a mass production market, but still we are interested to, to learn. You know what I really, really think the future for this market is? Uh, I believe that Javil, uh, with all the different efforts that, mm -hmm. the, that you are doing in bringing, lowering the cost for in the volume production of different technologies, including silicon photonics, I think the future, the future of hyperspectral is really to go into the CMOS lines. And for that, I think I am so happy of having IMEC in the meeting today. Paul, thank you very much for being with us. Tell us, tell us about the R&D lines of IMEC in hyperspectral imaging for CMOS compatibility. The floor and the attention of everyone is yours. Thank you very much, Jose. So I'm a business developer at IMEC for the hyperspectral imaging activity, but also custom image sensors. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen with you. all the way from Loven, I actually had the chance of visiting this, the CMOS line, the 300 millimeter CMOS line is outstanding what you guys have there. The floor is yours, Paul. Okay, so IMEC, uh, you're talking about uh, CMOS line indeed. Uh, IMEC, the core DNA of, of IMEC is, uh, is semiconductor. And uh, we have two fabs uh, at IMEC, uh, two manufacturing fabs and R&D fabs actually. That, uh, that are uh, there and that we use to, uh, to also make a special type of devices uh, using a scalable uh, manufacturing process, and which is CMOS imaging type of compatible process. Uh, IMEC is a nonprofit company based in Belgium, and uh, we are 4,000 people there, mostly uh, engineers and, and, and doctors. 
And uh, we not only make research, but also uh, low volume manufacturing here. And this low volume manufacturing for IMEC is, is actually very dependent on the market we are thinking of. Uh, we make low volume manufacturing, for example, for uh, not the mass consumer markets, but every market that is uh, called niche. Um, we are a company that is uh, providing in hyperspectral imaging uh, the developed solutions, hyperspectral solutions, and we develop uh, not only sensors, but also systems and software in order to make uh, a user friendly um, uh, enhanced solutions for uh, users of hyperspectral imaging. The core, core activity the core differentiation we have is actually we make the spectral filters deposition directly on the wafer or on the glass, and that enables us to um, to miniaturize and to to be very scalable if volumes is, is necessary because we can put these filters uh, on the wafer and have these filters deposited duplicated on on several chips on thousands of chip, chips if necessary, and uh, the offer that we have on the market is is uh, not only uh, custom sensors developments, but also off-the-shelf uh, cameras and sensors that are there in, a bold, in order to, to enable the users to understand the value of hyperspectral imaging for them and for research. So we cover, we cover everything from the sensor up to the software for acquisition and visualization of uh, uh, hyperspectral HD. And that's uh, the main challenges that we, we had at the very beginning of our activity is that just providing spectral filters or, or sensors is not enough. There is a huge, uh, in the value chain, there is a huge link between each block and uh, between the user and IMAX, there are several levels. That's why we had to partner with industrial camera manufacturers like Zamiya or Photon Focus, for example, to provide uh, industrial grade cameras using sensors that we provide. And we also developed research cameras because hyperspectral imaging is not something that is uh, natural to understand for humans. It's something that we cannot see. So we understood that in order to, to users to understand the values, they need to have a research tool. And we built our own research tool with our systems named SnapScans that are combined with our software and to, to provide the best image quality we can with our technology. So we've got three families of products uh, that can be divided into ma two main streams, the high resolution ones and the real time ones, which are different uh, in terms of, uh, totally different, different in terms of use case. Uh, the snap scan cameras are mainly used in R&D environments, either outdoor or indoor, while the mosaic cameras can be used in everything from R&D to production. And we are also providing now, uh, starting from this year, UAV payload, because we saw that for agriculture and also for industrial maintenance, there is a huge need for hyperspectral imaging that is latent and that uh, we are willing to, to, to provide with a snapshot frame-based UAV payload. And to, that is very easy to use in order to reduce the time to prepare flights and to, to conduct the flight as well. That's the overall landscape of, of what IMEC does in the hyperspectral imaging. Now, I just want to talk to you about two trends that where we see the future. Um, the first one is, is short wave infrared. Uh, we are at IMEC pursuing now, starting from this year, short wave infrared hyperspectral imaging, because in this region of the spectrum, we see a lot of contrasts. This is the purpose of hyperspectral imaging, to increase the contrast, to see things that are invisible to the naked eye. And in the short wave infrared, you have got multiple absorption peaks of like water, uh, lipids, collagen, proteins, plastics, minerals. And you can see that on, on this graph on the left, uh, these peaks are between, oh, some of them are too, important ones are in between 1100 and 1700 nanometers. And that's why we, we've introduced this year uh, snap scans camera in the short wave infrared, but also mosaic cameras, the real-time imaging cameras uh, in, in this region as well. That could be useful for surveillance or water, for example, moisture uh, can, be in, can be useful to, to look at, uh, uh, at human-made objects versus natural ones. Lipids can be uh, are important for, uh, for food, for example, sorting. 
can be used in medical imaging for do, to look at proteins uh, in the pharmaceutical environment for proteins, for example, and of course in, in industrial environment. So there is a huge, uh, huge benefit of using short wave infrared because it's at the moment just monochrome images and we can make it hyperspectral now. And the second thing that I wanted to, to, to point out as a trend is the potential of hyperspectral imaging to also uh, improve accuracy of tracking. Uh, this is quite new research and, uh, and this, this research was carried out by the Griffith University and they, they pursued uh, research to demonstrate that hyperspectral imaging can be used to def define a material-based tracker that would recognize the material, not only motion or, or, or not only the shape or the color, but also the, the, the spectral signature. And that uh, enables to be more robust to very difficult type of situations where there are rotations or background clutter. This, what you can see on, on, on these uh, video images that were taken by uh, this University of Griffith. And uh, you can see that the red, the red square, which is actually the, the material-based dynamic tracker is uh, delivering better results than, uh, than others in situations where there is background clutter or, uh, or rotation. And the good thing is also that they demonstrated that this improvement of accuracy can be done uh, by training, extending uh, existing tracker to uh, material-based tracking. So that's all, there is a lot of potential, I believe, for surveillance type of application there, or robotics. That's in brief what I wanted to share uh, as a quick intro of what I may provide and is working on. Thank you very much, Paul. <laughs> Thank you. I was just, uh, sorry, I, I just forgot one thing. Sure. <laughs> see, uh, for the future is actually to bridge the gap between the end user and, and the technology suppliers, as some companies like IMEC uh, are in this, in this uh, YouTube live uh, meeting. Because, yeah, we need to have the system integrators uh, able to, to build systems with our technology and to make that directly used by uh, end users. And that's the, the biggest challenge that I see uh, for the next steps. That's very nice uh, story taken uh, that you mentioned at the end, because you noticed already at the beginning, you already said, basically, hyperspectral imaging is the topic where exactly uh, EPIC should intervene, because uh, without collaborations among all the steps in the value chain is really tough then to get to the end user. So it's a very good example you give us uh, today. You already mentioned also you have some collaboration, but do you think so? This audience here, so what is it exactly that towards, for example, these hyperspectral videos? Uh, are there, is there someone in some specific talk that, that could help you? Or you see like uh, uh, that anyway you have maybe already some settled situation, but I mean, I see you see the challenge. So if you have further comments for the people here, it would be maybe uh, something that we can profit from. Well, uh, to be honest, I've not seen, so there could be uh, obvious, obvious uh, connections with companies that are working the field of, of, uh, of surveillance, uh, I believe. It's uh, the, the the matter is to demonstrate first uh, on the field uh, the benefits, so that that's the companies, for example, that that could be uh, interested in in collaborating with would be some kind of Bosch security and surveillance of Fleur or I don't know Xenix. And, uh, also, that's I see that Mark is here. Uh, there are there. Are, we are technology supplier and uh, and we need the companies that are closer to the application. Okay, that's a very good comment. So this type of, of <laughs> networking sessions and, and connection session. Sure. So it was a really, really great uh, uh, contribution from you. So Mark, do you want maybe to comment on this? Do you think Paul is uh, is ready to work with you? <laughs> Are you too? <laughs> I, I hope so. I mean, uh, definitely that's a, that's a kind of collaboration that could be interesting. Yes, definitely. Uh, as we are also involved in hyperspectral. And by the way, we are not so far. <laughs> uh, so yes, uh, collaboration with uh, 
I need some time. I'm sure could have some. All right. We can. We, we also have. A... I'm talking about that later. Very good. <laughs> so I guess we have a, a question also from Achim, from Excelitas. Achim, you, you wrote it in the chat. Do you maybe want to, to, to talk directly with Paul about this question? <laughs> yes. Well, actually, I found this uh, quite interesting. I've seen that you're doing your own wafers, as it apparently. And uh, so uh, from a technological standpoint, um, I would be very interested to know uh, what, what are the real capacities. So I assume that you can put several filters on one wafer, one chip, right? Yes, so there are, there are some design constraints there, but yes, so actually we post-process only the wafers. We don't make the, we don't use uh, our own sensors in hyperspectral imaging. We use off the shelf or, or third parties designs, imager or, mm -hmm. or sensors design actually. And we can, yeah, we can uh, pattern uh, different types of filters, but of course, uh, when we start a custom pro project, we need to uh, to look at the system level, so lighting plus optics, uh, plus the sensor and the filters together. So that's that's part of a feasibility study each time we make a custom development. Uh, are there limitations in terms of of pixel size? So the pixel size, so the minimum patterning we've demonstrated uh, is around one micron. But we have never worked with such small pixels. Actually, we press, we prefer a lot bigger pixels, um, more than you know, around three micron minimum, because actually that enables to have more signal to noise ratio. So uh, there are some benefits, but uh, yeah, the the bigger pixels, if that's possible to use, then the better. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Then I guess we have a question also from Enrico from Eventec. Enrico, do you want to ask a question? If you mute yourself, wait, wait, wait. Now, 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 now you can speak. <laughs> uh, first question is, I mean, you, you are addressing only a commercial application. I know that Emac uh, is working also in space application. And of course the requirements are quite different uh, can you comment a requirement in terms of space application for high spectral resolution? Because I see that lately the interest for space is, is um, losing a little bit of momentum. Yeah, we, we see that frame-based uh, hyperspectral imaging is, is getting traction on, in space. And as, because actually that relaxes some constraints on the alignment, vibrations, thermal constraints, and so on. So we are we are we believe that with our the, the potential the, with our capability to pixel to pixel uh, to make a pixel to pixel filter design and patterning enables to to make this type of snapshots uh, uh, hyperspectral image image sensors. Uh, for, frame-based uh, hyperspectral sensors detector, detectors, the future of, of hyperspectral imaging for high resolution, but uh, also we believe that uh, because we can do, uh, we can pattern filters uh, on top of several rows of pixels, we can also make digital TDI to improve the SNR. So that's, uh, that's another benefit for space imaging in light, light starved conditions that is so something possible with our technology. There is also the, the, the trend to go to shorter infrared in, in space imaging. So that's why we're very interested actually in working with MCT type of detectors uh, in order to, to be able to provide a uh, you know, gas type of sensing, hyper spectral detectors. Uh, that would be a, a very interesting future path for us for space imaging. But then you, you will need to cool then, do you? So there, there actually, we, we have a limitation of expertise. Huh? So we will need to find a partner that is specialized in doing the focal plane array yeah. uh, and the, the cooling system. We are, we are not capable of doing that yeah, at IMA. Okay. And uh, in terms of uh, spectral band, uh, what is at the moment the limit uh, uh, given by the applications and by, of course, you know, the, the, the 
storage data processing, which is an, an issue. How many spectral bands uh, are you considering now? So that's that's case by case, but uh, the number of, of spectral bands is not the real problem for us. It's the matter is how wide is the range that is needs to be imaged at the same time. Mm -hmm. so the wider, the more design constraints we have in terms of uh, space, uh, yeah, of space on the sensor and also of the shape of the filters. So that's more number of bands is really something that is not problematic for us. Okay. And the, the filter are commercial or you make it yourself? I think I missed that. So, so we pattern that. So we will make the deposition and the patterning inside IMEC. Okay. Uh, but if there is at some point a volume consumer application that drives the volume, uh, then we would transfer that to a foundry. Okay. That, that's the objective of IMEC in the long term. But we are not there yet. We are. We have a company uh, spin-off named Spectricity. Mm -hmm. uh, that is specialized in spectrometers, miniaturized spectrometers, and uh, Spectricity is actually targeting uh, volume markets, and uh, and there there they have a, a real potential to to transfer this technology in the foundry to to make it uh, available at lower cost and larger scale. Thank you. Paul, from the YouTube universe, I get a lot of questions because you raise a very interesting topic, which is the need for s detectors. So we have, we're having a little bit of a debate here between Simon Ferrer from NIT, from New Infrared Technologies from France, and Pavel Malinowski, your, your, colleague, your colleague Pavel Malinowski. So basically, uh, Simon is wondering what technologies for s are being developed at IMEC, and are you working with colloidal quantum dot based or Bayer light filters? What technologies are you doing in s -Wheel? So in the SWIR, in the hyperspectral imaging team, we use off-the-shelf uh, in-gas sensor uh, that, is, that is commercially available. But uh, if we are, the question was related to quantum dots, uh, there in, on this field, we have uh, an activity, a pixel program in, uh, in the IMEC that is uh, developing uh, thin films and, and uh, not only developing them, but also making them, uh, I would say, um, patternable and deposited in volume on, on wafers and to be, to be able to be transferred to a large scale foundry. And this this team is working on the on different types of of, uh, of material and quantum dots have been demonstrated up to 1.5 micron so far uh, sensitivity. So uh, quantum dots can be tuned uh, in order to have a, a central wavelength peak that is uh, that is can be chosen. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have developed this technology at IMEC to. To, to make quantum dots uh, all at wafer level and uh, in the short wave infrared. The, so the work that you're doing in CQD in colloidal quantum dots is spectacular, really spectacular, but also the, your answer saying that you are looking for off the shelf s weird detectors is also very interesting for NIT. So Simon, you have a very good opportunity there. Paul, thank you very much for a great presentation. There's gonna be a lot of discussions later on the manufacturability of the cameras. You are on the money. It's quite fascinating what you do. Delta optical thin film. Oliver first. I cannot wait anymore. You need to take the stage. Oliver, thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. The attention of everyone is yours. So I'm sharing my screen now. Can you see it? Yeah. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Oliver Poos from uh, Delta Optical Thin Film. And at our uh, small company, we design and make uh, optical thin film filters uh, for OEM customers since many decades. And uh, like 10 years ago, based on our thin film technology, we developed the first what we call continuously variable filters uh, for our uh, customers, not for hyperspectral imaging, uh, but some customers had the idea to use them for hyperspectral imaging. And uh, because there was a uh, big interest in these filters, we developed a series of uh, hyperspectral imaging filters that were in their, with their performance uh, dedicated and tailored towards the requirements of hyperspectral imaging. 
So as you know, uh, the classical way is using prisms and gratings. So we use optical thin film technology like some other companies uh, that are present here in, um, in, the, in the meeting, but we do a, go a slightly different way. Uh, for one thing, we do not deposit on sensors. We deposit our filters on separate glass uh, substrates and we do not do any, uh, any pixelization or, or patterning. What we uh, make are bandpass filters that have in one direction of the filter a continuous gradient of center wavelength. So when you see these uh, spectral curves in the uh, bottom right, it's a continuous filter measured at discrete uh, locations. So if you measure at any other location, you will get any, uh, any other different wavelength. So it's really a continuous uh, filter. So it's really truly continuously hyper uh, spectral. And what is also different from other solutions uh, based on the complexity of our filters is that you do not only get very uh, sharp bands with a good spectral separation, you also get very deep blocking outside of any band from 200 to up 1200 uh, nanometers. So for silicon based detectors. So if you put these filters in front of an imaging detector, you will get a hyperspectral imaging detector that is very compact because it's directly in front of the sensor surface. It's mechanically very robust uh, because it can be directly mounted without any distance, unlike uh, prisms or gratings. And it's very light efficient uh, because of the high transmission of these uh, advanced thin film filters. And you get a detector that has a very high signal to background uh, ratio because of this deep uh, broadband blocking. And also compared to traditional um, uh, cameras, it's quite inexpensive uh, solution. And uh, there are two nice side benefits when you compare the filters with an imaging sensor. So you get a 3D hyperspectral imaging uh, for free. You can make that uh, purely based on image processing of a series of images that you acquire. And you can also make uh, cameras that uh, are snapshot cameras. So you can have scanning cameras, but you can also have snapshot cameras. And uh, on the two next slides, I will show some uh, cameras that have been commercialized by uh, two of our uh, customers. There are a few more, uh, for example, in satellite imaging, but unfortunately I'm not allowed to show anything from uh, satellite imaging. Um, however, here we have a camera from Glana that uh, was mounted on a commercial drone. And then that drone was uh, flown around uh, a building complex. And what you can see here, these two images uh, on, the, on the left bottom, these are not RGB images. These are 3D reconstructions taken from an uh, image series when the camera was flying around the, the building complex. And then afterwards, uh, the uh, 3D model was textured with some RGB information, but it's a really truly model of the big building complex. And yeah, then there, there's this thing that you have to trust and believe me, where the red arrow points next to the door, there's a, a flower pot. And we see here a close up of that flower pot. And where the yellow arrow points, uh, uh, a spectrum was extracted from that hyperspectral data cube and shown here on the right hand side. So I think that is a great example from Lana, how you can design a hyperspectral camera capable of 3D uh, for free. And at the same time, uh, la image large objects at high spatial resolution and at very good uh, spectral resolution. Um, you can also go to our webpage and search for that uh, publication or go directly to SPIE to download uh, several papers about uh, that topic. And the second application that I want to show you is um, a commercial camera from uh, Qbert, who have in a, in a very smart way combined uh, the filter with a micro lens array to turn that uh, principle into a hyperspectral uh, snapshot camera. And uh, you can see the camera is, is quite small. It's uh, only like six by six by six centimeters, something like that. And um, the interesting thing about Qbert is that they are in the market for hyperspectral imaging for several years now. And they have gone through a series of different uh, technology. So the first camera that they made, which is uh, the Firefly uh, here on the uh, left hand side is a prism based camera. Then we have um, a camera that is based on uh, a wafer level coated detector. And we have the new camera Ultras that is based on the filter approach from, from our company. <clears throat> and what you can see is, um, is quite interesting. So we also have, um, apart from the RGB image, uh, measured uh, spectra. 
And for the prism-based camera, we have very high fidelity spectra, as you can see here. There are error bars on the spectral uh, measurements, so very good spectral quality. Of course, with prism-based cameras, uh, the resolution was uh, not as high, the sp spatial resolution, but you can derive from the spectral data quite good quality um, um, indices, for example, for agricultural applications. So green is green and orange is orange, yellow is yellow. Um, then we have a wafer level coated camera from Qubit. And uh, the, this process of wafer level coating limits the spectral complexity of such filters. So you, although you get a better uh, spatial resolution, the measured spectra on, on the left-hand side have quite large uh, errors. And also the derived indices are quite uh, noisy. Now you can say that the new camera that is based on uh, the advanced uh, filter technology combines uh, the best of uh, both worlds. So it has very high um, spatial resolution and it has very good spectral quality. So definitely on level with uh, what you can get from a classical prism or grating based uh, camera. So you see the indices and you see also the spectral measurements that have very uh, small error bars for the filter based uh, solution. And here you can see how that works in practice. It's straightforward. You have um, the micro lens array and the filter um, in front of it. And on the image sensor, which uh, typically is quite a large image sensor, you get sub images at uh, different uh, center wavelengths. And they have chosen a combination of 11 times six, so 66 uh, spectral channels at, uh, as you can see, high uh, spatial resolution. So before Jose asks, um, what we would like to achieve is uh, we would like to get in touch with more uh, customers because uh, we have the same challenge with hyperspectral imaging like many other companies. The optical filter is a core component, but really at the very beginning of the value chain. And to close the gap to the application, you need uh, sensor manufacturers, camera manufacturers, software uh, companies who can turn the measurement results into really actionable uh, data for the customer. So we would like to be uh, part of more value chains to introduce that promising technology uh, into the market and to enable new applications uh, for, uh, for that technology. And of course, on the other hand, we can offer really uh, uh, innovative technology and a good alternative to other new approaches uh, on the market that gives you both high spectral and uh, spatial quality. So that was what I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Oliver, for your contribution. So is a, as you said, you answered already the, the, the perfect question. So <laughs> you, you did your job very well. So the question is from my side, are you scared that this market is a bit too much based on customization? Because what also before Paul said, he said often you need to adapt everything, uh, so filters to pixel size to everything that uh, related to the application. Do you fear this, that this maybe is a bit uh, hindering the development of the market or what is your thought about it? Um, yes, of, I mean, of course, different customer groups will need different uh, filters, uh, let's say spectral range, um, but, I think um, maybe our challenge is a little bit smaller than for, for iMac who really need to pattern for different solution for every single detector based on pixel size, pixel number and so forth. Uh, I mean, as we make the filter as a separate component, it can match a group of, of sensors as long as the physical dimensions are, are similar. And uh, But then, of course, again, for agriculture, you might need a certain wavelength range. And for different markets, you might need a slightly different wavelength range. So there will be customization, no doubt. OK, so but still, I see you're not scared. So that's the important thing. <laughs> as, as long as it's uh, in reasonable <laughs> limits and it's, it's, I mean, there are limitations to what is physically possible. Of m Many people want, want the the impossible, and then you need to find the right compromise. But until now, that was uh, quite successful, yeah. Very good, very good. So I see we have a, a question from Simon, from Jabil. If you want to unmute yourself, you can. Yes, hi, Oliver. Nice, nice uh, talking. Yeah, uh, did I understand correctly that you are mechanically uh, putting the filters in front of the image sensor? Yeah, so the filter is a separate component. It's typically coated on a one millimeter uh, thin or thick 
uh, fused silica substrate that is, uh, yeah, somehow mounted in front of the image sensor as close as possible. That can be mechanically mounted, but you can also, for example, glue it at the edges, um, whatever your preferred solution is, yeah. What's the level of accuracy that uh, you achieve and what is required from a camera perspective? Yeah, so based on the production principle of these filters, they are not, not identical. So it's, it's not possible to just uh, take the filter and mount it in, in the same location and you would know exactly where which wavelength is. So like, uh, but, but I think that's not really a practical issue because nowadays you need to calibrate uh, each um, hyperspectral camera, uh, typically both spectrally and radiometrically. Um, so for consumer cameras, you might want a different approach, but let's say for some more high grade cameras, um, I know from, from every manufacturer that each uh, individual unit needs to be uh, calibrated anyway. And uh, that calibration will also take care of the, of the variability of from filter to filter. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, I see. Yeah, we have a question again from Optis Balsas. Please, John, you can ask. Hi, Oliver. Thanks. Thanks for your very nice uh, presentation. Um, uh, have you ever tried to coat uh, a linear variable filter in, in two directions, so on two axes? One, so your, your examples are like just the y direction, right? And you might also have got inquiries. So we have seen their demands <clears throat> to do a, a gradient in x and in y, and preferably even a different type of gradient. <laughs> yeah, <possible>? yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, I mean, if you, by definition, a linear variable filter has only one wavelength gradient direction. So, uh, I mean, if you have two, two gradients, um, difficult to imagine, but, but, uh, I mean, what we have been asked, for example, is to make a gradient that is not linear necessarily. So we have made, uh, uh, ex that's why we do not call them linear variable filters anymore. We call them continuously variable filters. So we have made exponential. Uh, gradients, for example, to compensate for the change in bandwidth that these filters typically have. Um, I'm not really sure I understand or what you what you really mean by by two different gradients. Um, so you, you have a gradient on the y, right? So from, and then and then uh, additional gradient. So let's say you start at I don't know 800. And go to 1000 and, and you start also at 800 and go here maybe to 900 or so in, in this direction. Yeah. You think that's actually feasible? Yeah, I, I'm, I think that's if you want something like that, that sounds more like it would be something like, 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 like patterning. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, for example, what you need to do, I mean, if, let's say if you imagine you, you, you turn. You turn the filter with respect uh, to the sensor, then you actually have two gradients. And that is what needed to turn um, such a one gradient filter into a snapshot camera where you have a change in center wavelength along both axes of the, of the micro lens array. Mm -hmm. um, but to code it that way, uh, we, we haven't tried that yet. And I'm not sure how that could be possible. I was really impressed myself with the way that you actually made the, the non-linear non-linear filter and actually making the exponential. But you raised one interesting topic today. You raised that the fact that you are looking at micro-optics. We have actually one of the key companies in Epico micro-optics in the room. Uh, we have SUS micro-optics all the way from Neuchatel looking fantastic. Reinhard, how are you doing today? To you, let's see. One of the biggest complexities, I'm working with Reinhardt a lot, bringing micro-optics to many different markets. One of the biggest complexities that we're having is the, 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 the position of uh, different coatings on, on free-form wafer-level micro-optics. Uh, what is the experience on Delta, on the use of coatings on micro-optics? Uh, yeah, so sorry, did you ask uh, let's, me let's, or? First Oliver, and then we we'll go to Reinhardt. <laughs> yeah. Oliver. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so we, we never code on, on curved surfaces um, because if you, if, especially if it's micro optics, the curvature can be quite high. Uh, so the spectral performance will change uh, with the angle of, of incidence and the, with the position angle. Uh, so it would not really be possible to, to have the, the desired spectral performance um, that you want to achieve. It would only be possible 
for example, if the micro optics array would have a flat uh, rear surface mm -hmm. to coat the filter on, on that surface, but we haven't tried that yet. Reinhard. Yeah, so my interest is more uh, polymer on CMOS because uh, we see a strong interest uh, that uh, you get a free form uh, or larger, you know, typically if the pixels are very small, the micro optic is done by photoresist. If the pixels are bigger, what happens with some hyperspectral cameras, uh, the photoresist is not transparent. So we have to get a polymer on CMOS. So we see uh, an interest in, in industry to put an additional polymer layer of free form, a Schmidt, a Schmidt trigger plate, a, a aberration compensation directly on the CMOS sensor. So in this case, this could be a combination that, for example, you code, uh, your, your coding is directly on the CMOS, or there's a, whatever, a very thin glass plate. And then we print uh, the additional optics, micro optics, on top of your, uh, your filters. Okay. Well, the accuracy, to... this is possible for 300 millimeter, and accuracy is typically a micron. Yeah, I, I mean, mean yeah. maybe one word for these micro uh, lens arrays. I mean, people call them micro lens array, but the, 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 the ones that are used for the snapshot cameras, they are not micro lenses per pixel. They cover typically a large number of pixels to enable these sub images that are showed on, on the last slide maybe like 400 by 400 pixels or four, 500 by 500 pixels. So it's somewhat larger micro lenses. So you hear me? Yes. OK. <laughs> um, and now, so if there are no other questions, um, maybe we can uh, ask one of our users that is also present here in the room, comes from Mitomo Electric. So, do you want to tell us a bit why you wanted to attend this meeting and uh, what is your interest here for applications? You can unmute. Yeah, perfect. You unmute yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, as a manufacturer of type 2 super lattice, uh, SWIR and uh, m, uh, m wire detectors, FPA, uh, we seem Smith Electric are uh, expecting the uh, market expand of hyperspectral imaging. Uh, so far, most of applications of hyperspectral imaging seems to be in laboratory use. However, I feel that more industrial use case of hyperspectral imaging is coming now. Uh, today, I'm joining here to run what could be the killer application in the uh, market of hyperspectral imaging, especially in uh, sphere and, and, and wire wavelength regions. And uh, honestly, uh, another reason is uh, we are a Japanese company, but uh, most of our customers of type lattice detectors are uh, uh, European companies. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your, for your contribution. So that's uh, really listen up and see if you have also more inputs in the, during the meeting. So now if I see there is no other questions, we maybe go on with our agenda because Thierry should take his spot on stage. <laughs> so there okay. you go, Thierry. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> the floor is yours. Thanks. So. Can you see my screen? Yes, if you put also, yeah, exactly. Now it's yours, great. Okay, <laughs> so thanks very much for uh, offering me the opportunity to introduce our activity in the hyperspectral imaging. And uh, actually, Lambda X is a member of EPIC for about two years now, close to two years. And it's the second time we have the opportunity to talk about that uh, hyperspectral imaging technology. So I guess it will be a, a new topic for many of those uh, attending here, but uh, I think it can be uh, quite interesting. So to describe uh, what, who is Lambda X and what we do, uh, we have three types of different activities. We are a product manufacturer a company. We manufacture, um, manufacture methodology tools for the ophthalmic market. And those instruments, for those instruments, we are working worldwide leader in uh, two segments, which are contact lens quality control and intraocular lenses quality control. And we are there for about 12 years now. Uh, besides this product manufacturing activity, we have some engineering um, 
uh, optical engineering and system engineering activities where we supply engineering services to develop a custom optical system for various markets, uh, industry uh, with a focus on medical, also space, this is where we are coming from, and uh, security. And you see here some example of a, a made infrared a camera and uh, here uh, of uh, some other uh, device for the medical market. And next to this, uh, we have also a contract manufacturing uh, activity where uh, we uh, manufacture optical based products for third party. And uh, in this case, we provide our facility, which is a clean room facility, all the high precision tooling uh, you need for optics, like gluing, for assembly, for alignment. The metrology, uh, we can provide, of course, our design services and certification services. So basically, we are a team of 45 people. and. Uh, we have been um, incorporated in 1996, so 24 years of existence, and we are a spin-off from uh, University uh, Libre of Brussels. So what can we do for the hyperspectral community? Actually, what uh, we propose is to deliver a quite innovative hyperspectral imaging device. And it's different from probably that all you have heard so far. Uh, it's a multiplexed uh, Fourier transform spectrometer-based technology, which results of having one spectrometer per pixel. So there are several beauty about, uh, beauties about this technology is that we prevent, uh, we, it provides at the same time the high spatial resolution as far as diffraction limit, but also very high spectral resolution. We go down to 0.13 uh, nanometer at 400 nanometer. The second beauty of it is that we have absolutely no compromise on photon. We don't lose any photon in the technology we use. We don't use any spectral filtering. We don't use any spatial filtering for the, uh, of the light that is entering the system. And we provide, the third beauty of it is we provide a continuous um, spectral range, uh, which is the uh, detector that we use, the spectral range of the detector we use. The last aspect of the technology part of this uh, camera is that um, it is compact and robust, much more compact than <clears throat> Uh, I would say um, some equivalent for the applications we are following. And the price to pay to get all of this is only that it cannot be operated real time. So we don't go for video type of applications. Uh, we need a bit, some seconds to acquire all the image in order to extract the spectral information for every pixel. So what is the interest for the user is that, well, it's a high throughput. It is seen as a high throughput hyperspectral imaging device. Namely, we can generate uh, three megapixel data cubes in about 100 seconds uh, in one acquisition cycle. Uh, for some of the applications we are shooting at, namely global Roman imaging, uh, we go more than 1,000 times faster than any other confocal Raman microscope. It's quite versatile. Uh, you can, the, customer, the end user can tune the field of view, let's say in the millimeter, square millimeter to square centimeter range. And, um, which means that what we are shooting at is not really far field uh, applications, but more near field applications like microscopy. And for those microscopic applications, uh, the other interesting of interest of our technology it does it doesn't uh, uh, induce any sample damage, which for the biotech application is quite uh, important. So it's important to talk about applications. Um, and as I mentioned, we look for at this moment for near field application. This is where we focus, but we could also work on some far field applications, but uh, well, we can tackle too many at the same time. So for the past years, we have been working on a fluorescence spectral imaging. Uh, the camera was, uh, as proven to be quite powerful, has been illustrated here on the right hand side of the, of the, of the slide. However, uh, we could not really find a, a true market for that. It seems that pathologists are more, more or less uh, happy with uh, color images and uh, they are not that much interested to dig further into the spectral content of the image. However, we have a total different story with global Raman imaging because here our technology is feeling, is, uh, feeling uh, a missing link uh, which uh, is uh, not available uh, from, a, I would say, the, the traditional uh, Raman microscope. And, uh, here are some examples of the applications we can cover. So this goes from pharma, where you can get active um, principal ingredients, a spatial distribution on a, on a drug as a 
illustrated here. So we can extract the Raman shift uh, uh, information at every pixel of multiple components. A second, in the biotech, we do what we are doing is a, a surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy to image cells and tissue and, uh, and living matter material. And you see here an example. And the third one is uh, an industrial application. Someone was looking for uh, asking for industrial application. Actually, we found one and we deliver one device uh, to uh, an industrial who was eager to be able to detect, to make some contamination control. That means to be able to identify some chemical species over a certain field of view without any way to predict where this could be. And this is uh, the third example that we show for um, um, our global Ramanamic imaging application. So what can you do for us? Uh, as I heard from uh, several contributors, every collaboration is welcome for us and we will like to promote it uh, if it is focusing on use case uh, at end user level. Obviously, that's really what um, uh, we are all heading for. And then meaning that uh, we should work together, but it should involve at some point some end user samples. I talk about samples because for near field applications, we work on samples, we don't work uh, or on substrates, but we don't work, we don't try, we don't um, uh, image some uh, far field scenes. And on the hardware side, uh, what, we are, uh, what we are interested in is to get no noise 2D detectors. Today, we work with CMOS based detectors uh, in the 400 to 900 nanometer range, but as may, uh, mostly most of you have, uh, have said, we are also uh, uh, interested uh, in the Raman uh, imaging. Uh, to go to shortwave infrared. So we are willing to work with uh, shortwave infrared uh, detectors uh, to, uh, to make Raman global imaging. We also need to use a narrowband solid state laser source. And those are in the range of 100 milliwatt to a few watts. So that's a lot. But actually, since we distribute all the laser light over the field of view, uh, it's, uh, it's not so much in this case. And we are also interested that people develop some um, Hypercube data analysis software, and uh, to go as far as to um, uh, to reach the end user, then we are also interested in commercial distribution uh, discussions. Since uh, we are now getting close to a commercial product, and that's the end of my introduction. And I welcome any questions. The end of a fantastic presentation with from Thierry. I am very impressed with Willanda X. They are making a big impact on the in the space market. Uh, I cannot wait anymore. You already answered the epic question, so let's let's go hardcore. Uh, there's a big debate in the industry, and I want Landa X to give, me, to give me the first impression. We have to compare from the application point of view, hyperspectral with multispectral. I already have a person in the chat. I would like to say hello to Hans Fischer. Hans Fischer is uh, telling me, in real life, most features most applications can be solved with a multispectral sensor, especially in the agriculture. He's saying, well, most of my customers are looking at five to 10 bands in the 700 nanometers to two micrometers. I know that Lambda X is very well positioned both on the multispectral and the hyperspectral. Uh, in your opinion, Thierry, what do you think about this debate? Is there a need, a market need on, on hyperspectral for large volume applications or multispectral can do the job? Well, so namely uh, what we are uh, targeting as application is uh, applications that are demanding uh, high spectral resolution. So we will really go uh, uh, hyperspectral and we, know we will not go uh, multispectral. And, uh, and uh, the solutions we have developed so far was really uh, uh, are requesting the, the especially Raman. For, for Raman, you need a really uh, a narrow uh, laser uh, source as well as uh, high uh, high resolution um, uh, camera. So I'm not in, a very, in the best position to describe some multispectral based application. Uh, of course, if you can do the, if you can do the, the, the ultimate uh, uh, resolution, you could, uh, uh, you could also uh, work on the less demanding spectral uh, resolved applications. But uh, oh, yeah, we are looking to the other end let's, let's of the resolution. Producer. 
Um, perhaps your future customer. So, Frejo and Huimeda, thank you very much for being with us this uh, this afternoon. Uh, Sexo is a company, Sexus is a company uh, very active in the field of agriculture. Uh, what do you think about these comments that we're getting? Is there a need for hyperspectral or does multispectral does the job for agriculture, Mark? Uh, it's a good question. Um, uh, we see a good, uh, for our business, we see a good uh, future for hyperspectral imaging. Um, I will show uh, a case uh, in my presentation. And also for Ramon spectroscopy, uh, we, we think that there, there could be opportunities. The only problem is in our business of, uh, of seed industry, there is not much research being done at the moment to relate all kinds of traits of seeds to hyperspectral information. So that keeps us from, uh, from being very successful in this particular segment of the market, but we see a good future for it. Fred, I'm going to ask you a favor in front of everyone here and in YouTube. I want to eventually organize a meeting on photonics for agriculture in the yeah. Netherlands, because I live in the Netherlands, in Bonn in Nordwijk, and also okay. because the, 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 the market uh, in the Netherlands for agriculture, especially for precision agriculture, is booming right now, and I want yes. photonics to be considered there. Yes. Uh, before we go to the next presentation, I want to talk to my friend from the semicon industry, from Advanced Semicon Engineering, of, uh, Bradford from ASC. Thank you very much for being with us this afternoon, Brad. Uh, so far, we already got some technology. We got some questions already, very interesting about the comparison between multispectral and hyperspectral. I want to see why ASC, a giant in the semicon industry, is here and what kind of connections do you want to make today? ASC, we have, uh, Brad, we have a problem with your microphone. So you go to the yes, bottom yes, left yes. corner. Of the, yes, we okay, can hear yep. you now. Yeah. We're good. Uh, um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm a little surprised, uh, Jose, to be put on the spot, but actually I am joining today for a more general culture. Okay. Uh, but what I will say is that as time goes on, uh, we are seeing more applications, which let, look, at, look, at, look at your cell phone. So who would have imagined that you would have... Um, a uh, high resolution camera on your cell phone years ago. So one, one could imagine that in, in 20 years, you would have uh, 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 much more complex uh, optics and filters uh, in a miniaturized application. And, and such an application could be of interest uh, uh, to uh, my company uh, to, to do uh, assembly for that. I'm noticing... I'm noticing my sound quality. I have some bandwidth issues, so uh, I think it's best if I... Uh, I see you crystal uh, I, clear and I okay. hear you even better. Okay. Uh, the ASC has been a great EPIC member when it comes to incorporating technologies for the volume production. So later, I'm gonna introduce you to, to SUS Micro Optics for answering this question, what the polymer uh, compatibility with the CMOS industry. But I want to go to Spain now. I want to go to Alejandro okay. Rosales. Thank you, Alejandro, Jose. I want to hear the views of Iris when it comes to this question that we're getting online about the comparison between hyperspectral and multispectral from the end user, the guy who doesn't yeah. know anything about photonics from his point of view. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, this is something that uh, I have in my presentation uh, in relation to the providers of uh, um, hyperspectral hyper cameras. In a lot of cases, uh, we have seen that uh, it could be better um, to have maybe a cheaper uh, and maybe faster uh, multispectral camera instead having a very sophisticated uh, uh, multispectral camera which is consequently more expensive okay uh, obviously it depends on the application as the previous uh, speaker explained um, in some applications you need a very high resolution but in many industrial applications industrial um, uh, production lines uh, we don't need so sophisticated uh, resolution. In fact, for um, um, absorption spectroscopy, uh, in particular in the condensed uh, uh, matter, uh, the, your uh, spectra are usually very, very smooth. So um, resolution, obviously, if you have at the same price, high resolution, that's Welcome, <laughs> for sure. But uh, uh, in the, most of the cases, uh, this is not the, the, the real case. And uh, so um, it could be very, very interesting 
uh, to have uh, in the market after the, after the shelf uh, solutions uh, cheaper and based uh, on multispectral uh, solutions, uh, particularly in the short wave range. Alejandro, way, the reason why I give you the stage right now is because I think the next speaker is going to be a partner, and you will see why. Uh, I'm going to go to Finland, and I'm going to give the floor to Philip. Thank you very much for being with us uh, this afternoon. The floor and the attention of everyone is yours. Thank you, Jose. If you could sell positive energy by the kilo, you would be a rich man. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for your leadership and this opportunity. Yes, I'm gonna, over, I'm gonna just present a quick overview of our technology in VTT um, in less than six minutes. Um, so essentially, we, we build everything on Fabi-Perot interferometers that we have been developing for 200,000 hours. Uh, those uh, Fabi-Perot interferometers are a set of two mirrors that where the surface is engineered to match the, the given uh, desired wavelength uh, range. Uh, we then have harmonics going through this filter, and uh, those Fabi-Perot interferometers are essentially of two types, or the MEMS uh, type that is uh, having uh, that are having apertures from one to four millimeter millimeters uh, for consumer business, uh, lower cost obviously, and then we have the large aperture uh, equivalent uh, that uh, well, I mean, the aperture can be up to uh, 25 millimeters. And uh, over the years, we developed uh, a series of uh, filters that cover anything from UV to thermal infrared. Uh, and uh, with uh, particular attention to the last one here on the bottom left, uh, a MEMS that covers the full CMOS range for, with only one MEMS. So something that is not always very clear is what is our competitiveness and differentiation? And I'm happy that uh, I have this opportunity to, to, to explain this. In one of the first slides, uh, we saw a VTT uh, in the box of uh, a research organization, but we also do uh, provide uh, manufacturing services for, for small volumes of, of uh, MEMS. And uh, some of these MEMS are already in commercial products. So what is differentiating us? Uh, essentially, we have frame imaging. Uh, we don't do push broom imaging, so that fits stationary systems, uh, drones, satellites, medical systems where you, we don't, you don't want to move the camera or the things are not moving especially. Uh, you get geometrical accuracy, you can have also topography, stereo photography. Uh, then something uh, that is important to know is that we can take any image sensor. Uh, we, we simply would make a camera with that. Uh, and we exploit every pixel of the image sensor. So we don't have to deposit anything on the image sensor and sacrifice a matrix of pixels. We exploit everyone. So we have the full resolution. And uh, it's fully programmable. You get to choose exactly what you want to see. If you want to pick two wavelengths uh, exactly to see the, uh, to, to, to image the sulfur dioxide pollution, you do it. If you want to browse the full spectrum, you do it. Uh, we have an open Python interface, and our customers are building their, their, their competitiveness by understanding the data, integrating the way they want, and, uh, and building their software and AI. And then finally, it's mass manufacturable. Our MEMS is our, our destina, uh, destined to be a, a consumer, consumer MEMS. So, but it's more than imaging. We, we, we don't only do cameras. On the left-hand side, you see our latest baby uh, we're working on. It's a cubic inch camera based on a MEMS. Uh, but, and we, we did many, many different types of cameras. Some, some are flying in space now, uh, some are for medical purposes. But we also apply the same filters to light sources so that we have uh, miniaturized tunable light sources or not miniaturized for that matter. Uh, for specific applications, sometimes you don't want to to put too much light, too much light uh, in, in 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 some places. For example, in an eye, in an eye for for the back of the eye uh, examination. And finally, we also have uh, active hyperspectral sensing, where the light source is a white laser that can be one million times brighter than the sun, goes through a MEMS and targets something more than one kilometer away and uh, you get back the spectrum and you do a real-time classification. We, we do it for many things, uh, including mineral ores and uh, in traffic, 
and what not. I mean, only the imagination is the limit. So it's not only cameras, it's light sources and remote sensing. So what, what is our offering is uh, essentially uh, that we would make camera prototypes based on specifications that are sometimes amazing. I, I, cannot, I cannot disclose, but it would be really nice. Uh, specifications from our clients. Uh, we also do light sources and, uh, and remote sensing systems. Uh, we do a very small series productions, uh, like if you need 10, 15 cameras, we will do it. But otherwise, we would have partners. Uh, we have a small volume production uh, in what we call FTT MEMS FAP for MEMS and also for uh, large aperture uh, systems, uh, or even sometimes only the mirrors. We do it in Espo near Helsinki where our silicon manufacturing is. We also offer AI services uh, for image treatment algorithms uh, for different business cases. We exclusively offer non-exclusive IP licensing because of the potential of this technology. And we have a vast client ecosystem and sometimes some clients can, can uh, together uh, build more value together with us or with others. And uh, this is a, an example of uh, some successes you see here from left to the right, uh, different uh, uh, customers that are accepting to be, to be uh, revealed. Of course, there are others that, that, that won't. Uh, it started with Senop, uh, former known as Ricola. Uh, they are now a reference for agriculture camera, cameras based on our system. Uh, then our spin-off Spectral Engines in 2013 uh, is very successful and got a, a, a Prism Award. Uh, the Skin Camera from Revenio, uh, TrueTag Technologies, uh, Prism Award winner also in Photonics West uh, with their uh, daughter company Hinalea. Uh, Hamamatsu also uh, took some technology from us and now we, are, we have flying uh, nanosatellites uh, with shortwave infrared. And, and visible also, uh, sending us very nice images. And just sm small note, Specim with the leader in, in uh, Push Broom, uh, hyperspectral imaging is actually also a spin-off from VTT. It's based on 10 years of work in, in VTT, but we are not active in Push Broom uh, anymore. And that is my talk. Thank you very much, Philip, for your contribution. So we have seen, you have really answered already both the questions, what do you need, what you can offer, so really impressive, thank you. And of course, if I see your shopping list, I mean, uh, tunable light sources, we have here someone that can talk to you immediately. So NKT Photonics, for example. So I guess you have Ross here that wants to say a word to you, at least now and then also later, probably. <laughs> yeah, so you, uh, hi, this is Ross. Uh, you said you're already using white light lasers um, as a front end for some of the hyperspectral measurements that I, I understood. Yes. Um, so where do you say, like, I guess my, my question for the whole of, of, of this session is really the difference between kind of ambient and more passive illumination applications and active illuminations. Yes. So maybe you'd have a, a comment on some applications that maybe are more suited to, to active illumination. Yes, so uh, we do everything like uh, ambient light. Uh, sometimes we use AI or even uh, some other sources to uh, image pollution uh, from a plume, from a chimney or from a boat. But we also sometimes don't want to bother and we have that so much bright source that day or night doesn't matter at all. You can, you can uh, map all the minerals, mineral ores in, a, in an open mine pit or in an under, underground pit. Um, I mean, we, we, we do all the, all the systems, ambient light, uh, assisted light, specific light, tunable light sources, and then uh, those super bright white lasers and everything in between. Then I know if I remember well that well, there is first Oliver, and then we have also Paul. But let's start with Oliver, he was first asking the question. You are muted. <laughs> now again, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Philip, thanks for, for the presentation. Um, I wonder how do you handle the harmonics and the limited uh, 
free spectral range uh, if you have these harmonics or if you don't do anything about them? Yeah, so it depends on the on the wavelength range you're talking about. But essentially, uh, one of our key things uh, is to read uh, the harmonics with different pixels. Like in the visible, it would be uh, the RGB or RGB and near infrared pixels will pick uh, the harmonics uh, so that we can cover a broader range. Now, when you go to the infrared, you have sometimes less harmonics. Sometimes yeah. only one is only one is there, and then you don't have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Is it the case maybe also for Thierry? Thierry? <laughs> maybe Oliver, can you repeat the question to him as well? Um, sorry? If you can repeat the same question to, to Thierry, that maybe uh, he can catch up on this question too. Um, I'm not really sure that, uh, that I understand that technology well enough to, to uh, pose that same question to him. Might be totally irrelevant for him. <laughs> Yes, actually, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't. Uh, well, I, I don't think it um, it it addresses our technology, uh, and um, well, I don't see this kind of uh, uh, type of limit for for our technology. However, I may uh, refer to our um, technical experts with that respect. Okay, that's also good to know. But now we yeah. have Paul asking a question. So let's see what Paul has to ask. You're muted. Okay. No, I am or? No, no, we can hear you. <laughs> yeah, you um, I, I was wondering, so you are doing a time multiplexed spectral imaging. Is there a minimum time between two spectral images when operating the, the MEM smear? MEM smear? If, you, if you switch from one band to another band, uh, uh, let's say arbitrarily to both ends of the spectrum, it might take uh, a, few, a few milliseconds. If, if, you, uh, if you do a continuous sweep, uh, for, let's say from 400 nanometers to 1000, uh, then you could record 600 bands in, in two seconds. Okay, so it's milliseconds, two seconds. Okay. That's it, yeah, ballpark figure. Thank you. Very good. So if there are no other questions, Anna, there's Jose. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, from the YouTube universe, thank you, YouTubers, for paying so much attention. We are having so much interest uh, in the debate here. Andreas Brand, I think he's my friend from Fraunhofer ISC. Andreas Brand is wondering, does anybody know of someone offering resolved thin film thickness measurements via multi or hyperspectral reflectometry? Well, this is not the first time we have this question, and yes, we, we, we can use that, yeah. Oliver, you are talking to many of the Oliver Ports from Delta. You're talking to many, many, many camera suppliers. Do you know anybody who is developing a process customized for the thin film thickness measurements? Not that I've heard of. Um, I mean, we have customers in film film measurement technology, but that's typically based on lipsymmetry these days. Um, no. Uh, we have Roy from Aymen, uh, all the way from one of the most beautiful areas in the world, all the way from Galicia, from Vigo in Spain. Roy, how are you doing today? Hi, thanks. Roy, you are, you are bringing multispectral imaging to the process control monitoring. Aymen is fantastic on this. You're going to have a presentation later, but are you aware of anyone actually doing a hyperspectral multispectral solutions for measurement of thin film deposition layers? Uh, actually, not. Uh, I think Iris, uh, we have Alejandro in the meeting. I know that they were doing something with uh, fluorescence and trying to estimate the thickness of some layers, but... Uh, Iris, they... I'm going to put you in perspective here. Fraunhofer ISC in Würzburg, they are really, really one of the best people that I know in the, in the solar industry, so this could be a fantastic potential customer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in fact, just for answering the the, the, the question or the suggestion from Roy, thank you by the way. <laughs> yes, we have been working in a couple of projects related to use optical solution for measuring in real time for industrial roll to roll systems. Um, films thickness, but not for um, um, coating or deposition yet. Okay. However, 
it could be discussed because we have some experience on that. So uh, yeah. please send me an email and we, we can have a conversation about Alejandro, it. Alejandro, Andreas, you're going to be introduced. We have to use epic as a verb. You're going to be epic. Thank you very much. And we continue with the, with the program today. I think we cannot wait any longer. We need to go to the agriculture and user. Fred, once again, Huyemedag, thank you for being with us this afternoon. Tell us how the supply chain can help you today. The floor and the attention of everyone is Van Jao. Okay, thank you. I'm going to uh, pick up the presentation. Use the delicate touch. Uh, there you go. Yeah, I hope I have the right one. Okay. Yes. Now, crystal clear. The floor is yours. Let's hope it's okay. Um, uh, thank you all for attending, at least uh, in these uh, strange days. Um, I have a presentation. I've set now my um, egg boil timer at six minutes. So I rush you through the, the, through the slides. Um, okay. So uh, on the menu today, I will explain a little bit about the background of my talk uh, and who we are. I will uh, try to say what problem we try to solve and why we use hyperspectral imaging. Um, I will show the solution and some lessons learned. At least we learned something from it. So um, I'm from Secuso, which stands for Seed Quality Solutions. And we are a company that develops machines, instruments, for the seed industry, and that covers analysis, sorting, and precision sowing of seeds. And we use uh, in our machines and instruments uh, different types of uh, imaging, like RGB, just the normal ones, uh, but also fluorescence, X-ray, and hyperspectral imaging, and combinations of it. Okay, so what we are talking about is what they call uh, purity sorting of seeds. So if you have a bunch of seeds, you want to make sure that all are from the same crop. And everything which is not belonging to the crop is called debris. So um, that could be everything. That could also be stones. In our case, um, which I present here, it's about oats purity. And oats are an ingredient uh, in foods for people that are intolerant for gluten. And so it's very important that in these uh, oats, there are no other kernels which could be uh, rye, barley, or wheat, because then people get problems with, uh, with what they eat. And um, these other uh, materials, they can be uh, detected on, on shape and size and color, etc. The only thing is that barley seeds, which you can make beer of, uh, do resemble very much to oats. And uh, we are looking now at that in a, in a, let's say in a million oat seeds, it's only allowed to have about uh, 10 ppm. So only 10 different kernels up to the million oats. And you can imagine that on, a, uh, on an agriculture process where they use uh, 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 lorries and silos, et cetera, there are always re residues from previous batches inside. So from the field to the, to the factory, there can be contamination. And so our job was to get 98% of all bad resi residuals in a, in a batch and only have a, a restriction less than 1%. And that's quite a tough challenge. So this gives an idea of what we're looking for. Um, you see the, on the left, you see a barley seed and behind it, an oat seed. And they, they look quite similar. Although in this case, I would say no problem, but if you have all different, different seeds, then sometimes you can't recognize it easily. And that's why we um, uh, are using NIR spectra as well um, to detect whether it's a barley or an oat, because there are no gluten in, uh, in oats and in the other types of kernels there are. And that's the chemical difference we are looking for. And the strange thing is, if you look at the individual spectra, I'm not able as a human to, to say from a spectrum if it's an oat or a barley or rye or wheat. So it takes a lot of machine learning to get this information out. So what we did was uh, build a sorting machine, which has a conveyor belt with 20, 22 parallel lanes. 
and to do a positive selection. So we blow off everything that we recognize as an oat. Everything else is just dumped. And to use an RGB color imager for normal image analysis, and we use the NIR spectrum for having a more uh, accurate solution. So I'm sorry, I had not, not much time to draw. So um, we see here a, a, a belt with the seats on it. Um, this is the top view. You see here uh, all the seats in different lanes. Uh, this is a side view. We have one RGB camera. We have the hyperspectral camera. And together they detect whether a seat is a oat or not. And if it's an oat, we give it a air push and it drops in the, this bin. Everything else just drops down. So everything we don't recognize is just dropped. So that's, that's quite simple. So why hyperspectral imaging is then the question. Well, there are two reasons for it. And one is we have 22 lanes and we would require 22 spectrometers or 22 channels or whatever. So from an engineering standpoint, that's quite expensive. But more problematic is that if we use a spectrometer probe, we cannot just get the orientation and the height of the seats at the same spot because they're all different. They behave different, they have different height. So we never get a good spectrum out of it. And if you're not having uh, exactly positioned above the seat, then we get the, um, the spectrum of the belt mixed with the seat. And that's also making it very difficult to make a good decision. And then we have the issue of the internal part of the oat seat. I will, I will explain that later. So we used a uh, spec in Epic 17 near infrared imager with a quite broad range, a lot of bands. Uh, we chop off the, the bands at, uh, at, the, at the extremes of the spectrum because they are quite noisy. And we use a halogen illumination that uh, is still our, the pain in our ass because that's quite difficult to, um, to keep stable. So uh, for classification, how, how, how do we determine whether it's an oat or not? Um, and then I have to look at the internal of the oat. This is the uh, downside and uh, looks different from the upside and they have also a different spectrum. And that's why we need this hyperspectral imager to figure out which pixels and parts are interesting for the spectrum. And here we see that inside we get a different spectrum from the outside which looks more to barley than to um, a full oat hull here and so we use the the imaging to uh, to get out the right pixels with the right spectra and so finally we have an rgb camera with a 28 feature vector which goes to a supports vector machine for classification for our hyperspectral imaging, we um, assess every single pixel. So we classify every single pixel, and then we do a classifier on all those pixels of the seed. That gives an answer, and then finally we make a decision. So this is a screenshot that you see the same. Um, it's not so good probably, but this is the normal image. This is a shadow color hyperspectral image, and this is the classified pixels, and together that gives an idea of whether it's oats or not. So, lessons learned. Um, we think it's a very versatile equipment to do all kinds of things on biological objects. We get more and more ideas, especially in the, in the application of seeds. Um, we, um, we have seen that pre-processing of signals is required. So um, that, that's also a lot, lot of work we had to do with it. And we had a lot of problems with temperature stability of camera halogen illumination. And also even the cameras um, uh, was cooled. It still gave uh, problems to stability. Although the, I would say the Speccam is still a good camera. So that's what I would try to tell in a nutshell. And I hope um, it gives you some valuable information. 
Thank you very much, Fred. Yes, it was a really nice overview on your uh, on your uh, facility, so the technology that you have now implemented in your facility. And uh, as I heard already, you didn't have really a shopping list on what you can improve. So for sure, an illumination source is something that yes, you need, right? Yes, illumination source for NIR, <laughs> for illuminating a big, a big space, a big area, um, which is moving fast, that, that, uh, that would really help us. Yeah. Okay, that's a good uh, first point in the list. Then do you have any something else that also this audience would need so that can offer you? Well, um, um, I think um, I think a resolution is for us an issue, and especially the spatial resolution. So we use a push broom uh, systems, and they, they are very good. But um, we would like to increase the number of pixels so we can see a bigger area, and that makes it for our customers a more appealing technology. Okay, that's a good point. So I see that Paul has the, the, maybe the, the hand raised, so maybe he wants to comment already directly on his needs. Okay. <laughs> You're muted, Paul. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a question for you, Fred, on the on the um, on the fact that if the seeds are rotating and uh, or moving, accelerating, decelerating, how do, do you cope with this with a push broom camera? Uh, did you did you actually manage to compensate that, or don't you have this issue at all? Well, the 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 the, the once they come under the camera, the seats uh, are in rest, so they they move as fast as the as the belt, and they don't turn anymore. But they all don't have the same orientation, so they can be uh, aligned usually in the transport direction, but they can also be ninety degrees rotated. That, that happens. And if we would use a, a simple probe, then we would have, have a big big issue with it. And for the for the camera, the, the exposure time is so short that uh, the shutter time is so short that we don't have any problems with it. In terms of resolution, you're talking about higher resolution, but can you be more quantitative? In this yes. Um, um, we use at the moment 640 pixels uh, for the spatial resolution and we would like to have to increase to a, a two thousand pixels. Okay. So we don't know what uh, Specim uses as a, a sensors, but we hope that there will be coming uh, sensors which have a bigger spatial resolution. So Benz is okay. Very good. So I guess Paul had already something to work on, <laughs> and uh, and then I know Philip. As a question about uh, throughput, let's say, of the system, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I was wondering how many grains you are sorting per minute uh, ah, with your system. Per minute? I mean, do, uh, or per hour, do, uh, if you prefer. Uh, um, the system was built for 50 seats per second. So, but our customer already has, uh, has found ways to increase to 75. And it's about a few kilograms per 20 minutes. Okay. In that, in that order, yeah. Well, that's impressive, and and that means that your customer did something not uh, an improvement that is not photonic based. Maybe it's more on the robotic, or can you disclose more on this? The, on the supply of the seats to the belt. Ah, okay. Yeah. So the, the the beginning of the chain, let's say. Yeah, you have to put them on the belt, but also keep them separated. And that's. And then you can gain. Craft in the... itself. Yeah. I see. I see. Are there other questions in the room? Because if it's not the case, as I think it is, it's maybe time for Roy from Amen, so our okay. project leader <laughs> of, uh, of multiples, our European Horizon 2020 um, financed project. So I'm really happy that he's joining us. So Roy, if you want to show also our application, so maybe agriculture is also something we are missing. Let's see, but first we will introduce on what we are uh, doing in our with our end users in what? Yes, the screen is there. So, if you can put in a presentation mode. Yeah. No, yes. It's okay. Great. Okay. <laughs> so, hello, Francesca, uh, and thank you for the opportunity. So, uh, I'm the project coordinator of a multiple project. This is a photonics project funded by the Commission and Photonic Twenty One. 
and it has a duration of 36 months. Uh, we started uh, last uh, December, so we still at the very beginning of the project. And we are quite big uh, consortium with uh, 16 partners. And I see some of them uh, here on the meeting today. So the aim of the project uh, is to develop a scalable monitoring solution based on cutting edge uh, spectral sensors for uh, optimizing uh, different industrial processes, continuous process and also discrete uh, process. In the project, uh, we consider uh, different spectral sensors, mainly snapshot uh, hyperspectral cameras in the visible and also in the short wavelet infrared uh, range. And the good thing of these cameras is that uh, they provide uh, hyperspectral video. So for the applications we target, this is uh, very interesting. And we also uh, target the development of different spectrometer solution. Some of them based on organic electronics, which is a very novel detector uh, technology. And other based on, on laser spectroscopy, mainly focused on gas sensing. On top of these sensors, uh, we will also develop a IoT platform uh, combining uh, edge and cloud uh, infrastructure. In the edge side, uh, we will have uh, different embedded vision solutions that will be able to acquire and process in real time the, the data coming from the sensors, deploying, for instance, uh, deep learning uh, pipelines. And in the cloud side, we will have different uh, services providing uh, tools for the production managers uh, with big data, dashboards, decision support, and so on. But we will also uh, want to, to provide uh, data analytics and, and developers different tools uh, to, to develop uh, deep models to analyze hyperspectral data in an integrated way. So there will be tools to, to gather, uh, collect, and store the hyperspectral data, annotate this data, develop models, validate it, and also de deploy it at the end on the embedded uh, systems. So th the idea is, is to have a solution that for the, the users, for the industry, uh, is easy to use uh, and, and clean in the sense that they will not need to have a, a big infrastructure in the plant and people working and analyzing the data and also uh, helpful for developers that can remotely access the, the embedded vision systems and update the, the software. We focus uh, three different applications, uh, steel manufacturing, and this is a rolling mill. We plan to apply short wavelet infrared for uh, thermography. Uh, inside the, the reheating furnace, which is uh, the one that uh, consumes 80% of the energy of the plant. So it's really important to have a control combustion in, inside the, the furnace, but also uh, control the temperature of the steel slabs, of the walks, and, and so on. In the woodworking use case, uh, we work with a uh, bathroom uh, furniture uh, manufacturing manufacturer, and we plan to uh, analyze uh, the composition and the quality of the wood as input material, and also do some quality checks along the, the production line. And then we have a more exotic uh, use case, which is uh, in the food industry, the production of chocolate, and we will uh, analyze the composition and different uh, chemical and, and nutrients in, in, in the food. And some of the targets of the, the project, one of the main goals is to uh, provide a, a short wavelet infrared uh, hyperspectral camera that can be affordable and capable for uh, volume production. And here there are some technological challenges. Uh, I guess uh, Paul from MIMIC uh, could provide much more details than, than me uh, and also other challenge related with the spectrometers based on, on organic electronics. This is a technology that is uh, under development. And on the software side, uh, 
on one side, uh, we see that in general, there is a, a lack of uh, hyperspectral data repositories to develop uh, deep learning algorithms in general. There are some remote uh, sensing open data sets, but not uh, as much as in, in proximity sensing applications. And on the other side, we will produce a, a huge uh, volume of uh, hyperspectral data with these uh, cameras recording videos. So we need this infrastructure to efficiently collect uh, and manage this, this kind of data for development. And during the project, we will be uh, aware of uh, new potential market opportunities where we can deploy this, this solution. Um, yeah, I think this, this is all from my side. Thank you very much, Roy. Thank you. So it's really nice that we finally can, can present our project in a, in, a, in a broad audience, let's say, because as, as you said, it's a really fresh, <laughs> it's a really fresh uh, uh, project. But uh, as we said, um, basically IMEC is also not in the person of Paul, but is uh, present in our, in our uh, in our project, so maybe the, the the reference that Roy made during the talk. So maybe I'm uh, I make so and Paul can can comment on this. So sphere sensors is uh, definitely something that is in well demanded, but the volume production is maybe still a bit, as we heard, a, a difficulty. So maybe do you want to? Uh, would you like to comment on this, Paul? Yeah, sure. So basically, basically yes, that, that's the, for us at least. That's the very beginning. It's we are just starting uh, offering shortwave infrared hyperspectral detectors. So this year, uh, so that's that's uh, that's why the volume are not there, and it will take time so that they grow anyway. Because the the, the it depends what technology we use. But if we talk about in gas sensors, there are. Yeah, there are still on niche applications so that will not be um, that will not be a high volume type of market anyway. For high volume, we need to use different type of substrates, different type of of, uh, of technology that could be more scalable. And uh, and and there are some startups uh, working on this, and also IMEC is working on this. Um, yeah, that's uh, the biggest thing that I could say about short wave infrared. What is important for us is to have a partner that can be very good at making the assembly of the filter on on the sensor as well. This is a big challenge. Yeah. This uh, you also mentioned in your talk. So this stays also for us, of course, in multiple. We have already someone to rely on. We can ask also in this audience further in case we want further support. And also concerning the, the sensors, there's a uh, Philip that is suggesting actually that the Marion EPIC member is also preparing new sphere image sensors. Do you want to comment on this, Philip, that you told us now in the chat? Yes, they are basically across the street from us, so we know a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, they, they also prepare um, a sphere image sensor that is going to be much more affordable and covering uh, up to 1.7 micron. But don't, don't take my word for that, just check it out. We, we expect them to have better products in, in a few months. Uh, and uh, in VDT, we don't, need, we don't need anything else than to assemble the, the, the image sensor and our filters together. So we can't wait to, to, to build the first uh, shortwave infrared uh, low cost image sensor, image system. Very good, yeah. And we will keep for sure an eye on this and together with the, with the project but also inside EPIC in general, what is going on there. We had already a few times in Miriam presented meetings and speaking. So we are really, really excited about this. So yeah, we just finger crossed that everything goes very fast. And I know the yes. Yes, I have a question for Francesca Moglia. So <laughs> Francesca Moglia is uh, one of the people that we have in EPIC looking at helping our members get in European Commission money to develop their dreams. Uh, many companies today like Iris, uh, like Lambda X, they, like Xenix, like Photon Lines, they want to reach the medical market because Hyperspectra has a huge, huge application field in the medical business. How can you help them? Well, probably we could help them with a pilot line called MedFab. <laughs> this is also very fresh at the moment that was born as well, made basically in parallel with multiple. 
that is basically uh, supporting in, in the, the, the mass production by the end of the project of uh, photonics-based medical devices. So for sure, uh, I am now responsible for from EPIC side of the dissemination of this project like I'm doing for multiple. So this is definitely when multiple is ready to, for, for, for talking with the, with the Medfab will, and already we are now talking with Medfab also with EPIC members that are um, committed to hyperspectral imaging. So there is definitely a lot to talk about because uh, I know that uh, members and uh, uh, European project can really uh, support uh, and be supported by the pilot plan itself. So next year there will be calls also for um, possible customers and also possible ap applicants to basically accelerate the production of uh, photonics based uh, medical devices. So I am the now person to speak with and to myself, basically. I put hyperspectral imaging with medical application together, so it's easy. I'm here and please talk to me and I will make the bridge very easily on myself. <laughs> I also would like to say that uh, in the YouTube universe, we get already people really wanting to talk to Paul Danini. You are getting a lot of interest and especially from Hofer ISC is thinking, I think we can do a collaboration between IMEC, VTT and us. So they have something very big in mind. So things are working. You're being epic, Francesca. Continue. Very good. So do you do we see other questions now, or uh, should we proceed? Because I see here there are a lot of the our uh, coatings expert that maybe uh, we are our, our optics. So like we have Celia today uh, uh, attending the meeting. Do you maybe want to comment on what Hoya is doing and why are you attending here today? Sure. Um, hi everyone. I'm Seiya from Hoya, and and we are um, so current filter supplier and also provide some um, bias coating method. <coughs> and uh, uh, yeah, we also provide uh, various uh, components for the hyperspectral applications. And for that case, we face a difficulty to keep the very a precise surface finish. And it depends on the software or um, detection uh, methods, but uh, we would like to know what kind of level of the surface finish is required in this market. So that's why uh, to, to learn it, uh, I joined this meeting. Very good. So you, if you don't have the address of, of uh, Seiya, you can always, always ask us or Jose, as he said in, the, in his first slide. So if there is anything that we can discuss also with, with Hoya, we are very welcome to facilitate this. <laughs> now maybe we go on with our, with our agenda, because now um, it's, it's a bit the time also to uh, go back to more the, the hardware. So let's say uh, I'm not the right person to say the name of Alejandro because Jose would for sure say it better. <laughs> but it's probably now the time of Iris to show us a bit more of what he already mentioned so far. So Alejandro, if you want, the floor is yours. Ah, you're muted. Oh, oh I see. Sorry. <laughs> And I have the mic uh, on. Okay, um, okay. Uh, Francesca, sorry. Can you repeat the the the, the question? <laughs> that you are now on the floor, so you should ah, share the slides. <laughs> my chance. Okay, okay. <laughs> my glory moment. Okay. Great. <laughs> no <laughs> so, worries. So I will share, will share the, the screen with you. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see if uh, it works. Okay. Yeah, it's coming. Okay. Mm, okay. Uh, so, uh, theoretically, it should uh, work, but maybe you are seeing just the whole... Yeah, we, uh, no, 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 we see the slides, but not in presentation mode. If you go to presentation okay. mode... Okay, okay, okay. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, mm, I will try to, to fit my presentation into the um, slot, a five minute slot, whenever possible, okay? Um, uh, well, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, introduce our company, just for the, the, the ones who don't know us. Um, we are an engineering company. Uh, basically, we have a several product lines or services line, and one of them is the, is the application of spectroscopy, photonics in general, and spectroscopy in particular, uh, for um, uh, monitoring industrial process, processes. Okay, this is just the, the core business of uh, IRIS. 
uh, we we are not so so old maybe in, in teenagers teenagers we are basically teenagers <laughs> 10 years in the market um we have uh, the main facilities in barcelona and currently we're about 70 staff okay uh, what is relevant in our company is the, the our staff is very multidisciplinary so we have uh, not only physicists and optics uh, engineers but also we have uh, um, food uh, specialists uh, electronic engineers programmers so uh, it enables us to uh, tackle very uh, complex uh, uh, projects that involve a lot of uh, different um, fields of uh, knowledge. Um, the, the company matured into the um, uh, R&D ecosystem in Europe. Um, Francesca mentioned uh, previously uh, the participation of uh, uh, different uh, companies uh, uh, in this meeting, uh, in the multiple pro project, we also participate in multiple projects, uh, but this is not the only project that we are in involved in. Uh, in fact, uh, we are more or less in the top 10 uh, uh, SMEs uh, uh, in Europe in relation to the participation in uh, R&D projects. And that's great because uh, um, we had the opportunity to, to grow and not only to grow, to, to increase the, our uh, field of, of expertise. And uh, a few years ago, uh, we decided to take advantage of this uh, experience, to, the, the expertise, to tackle, to, to go to the market uh, for filling the gap, the, the gap that we, we saw uh, between uh, research, uh, great uh, solution, and industrial needs. Okay, um, there is a gap, and there is a real, uh, realistic gap. And um, well, we, we, we saw an opportunity on, on that. And uh, in, in fact, we are evolving uh, properly in the commercial area. And you can see in the screen some uh, typical applications from uh, um, our product line. Um, and particularly, particularly, we are working in the hyperspectral uh, field. In this um, uh, field, we have two possibilities, two, two options for, uh, for the market. Uh, one of them is the flexible concept. I mean, we adapt what we have to the specific production line. Obviously, we are not a manufacturer of um, a hyperspectral camera. We are integrators of a hyperspectral cameras. Uh, that's why we are particularly interested in this meeting to, to know all the, the, the novelties and the, the evolution of uh, uh, different um, uh, manufacturers because we are continuously needing uh, uh, new solutions, cheaper and so on, and we can comment it uh, later on, uh, because uh, we are trying to tackle every opportunity in relation to use hyperspectral imaging uh, for uh, quality control in the production line. Um, the second uh, line or the second uh, option that we have is a, a sort of a um, standalone product. It's what you see in the screen. Uh, we call this HPR. And um, it, is, it is like a okay, uh, all in one uh, system uh, for some specific applications that can be tackled with that. Uh, I would like to highlight that we have also not only the hardware, uh, but also the, um, we develop the, 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 the software for the, the, the solutions and the, the instruments. Um, and particularly, we also developed the chemometrics or machine learning models for tackling every specific solution. Okay, so we have the whole um, team for adapting uh, what we have to the different needs in the market. Uh, in relation to that, and this is my last uh, slide, I try to um, fulfill your uh, <laughs> uh, recommendations. Um, here I have what uh, we are looking for uh, the, the market. I mean, as we are in the end of the value chain, the toll chain, the industrial market. Um, we need uh, suppliers or providers of uh, hyperspectral cameras. Uh, to, um, let's say, um, solve or address one of several of the, the, uh, these points. First of all, uh, we work uh, in both uh, visible near and shortwave infrared, okay? Um, we need much more affordable and ideally, I would say, below 
the psychological threshold of uh, 10 uh, kilo euros, okay, uh, solutions. I know, I know it's, it's, <laughs> it's difficult to, to achieve that, but uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a key requirement for um, spreading the, the application of the hyperspectral technology in the market. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it will be uh, limited to some uh, high-end application in the military on mining or maybe um, research. But uh, honestly, uh, we, we consider that the industry is a huge potential market, no matter the specific industry, uh, a huge uh, potential market, in, particularly in uh, quality control. And we cannot tackle properly this market because of the, uh, the price of the current solutions. That's why uh, I previously commented that uh, it could be very convenient to uh, maybe uh, think of a, a multispectral multi instead of um, hyperspectral, because by downgrading, in some extent, the complexity of the, uh, the optical complexity of the system, maybe uh, the providers could also did reduce the price. Okay, um, in terms of special resolution, um, the previous speaker commented that uh, um, they are uh, developing something uh, for uh, sorting um, uh, early, uh, um, kernels, and uh, they are using the specking uh, system, uh, 640 uh, pixels. And this is really poor, but is the state of the art in the market, as far as I know in the short wave range, okay? So we honestly, in the short wave range, we need more uh, spatial resolution. It's very important. Uh, be, mainly because uh, clients are used to use the, the mobile phone, the, the smartphone, and they, they are capable to take a beautiful picture with a lot of uh, megapixels, <laughs> and they cannot understand how we are not able to sell something with more definition. <laughs> Okay. Uh, moreover, if, if we uh, um, have a very, very high price for, for that. So that's why we, we need more uh, resolution. And whenever possible, we need also faster cameras. And in relation to speed, I prefer to, to speak about the um, number of lines per second. Obviously, I'm talking about the push broom um, geometry, uh, one millisecond per line or less. Okay because there are many um, cases in the industry that require high speed. And high speed means, as Jose previously uh, commented, uh, handling a lot of data. But we are in the line of to, to, to address this, this point. Currently, we have a parallel computing in, the, in, in our systems. And uh, now we are working in a funded uh, Horizon 2020 uh, project um, with uh, Procter & Gamble and several partners to um, develop a cloud-based solution for handling the information uh, in the cloud. I mean, cloud computing, okay? So uh, it could uh, address some uh, issues in relation to the huge amount of data regenerated by the hyperspectral camera. Um, uh, and obviously, we need to take the, the data, raw data, from the um, site to the cloud. And uh, that's why uh, the project is related to 5G uh, communication solutions. That, that's why. So uh, hopefully we will uh, be delivering um, a new um, a solution for processing hyperspectral data in the cloud based on the uh, 5G solutions. Uh, this is just an uh, announcement. Okay. <laughs> uh, and and um, in relation to um, more application, not only related to the specific conveyor belt in the production line, but also for uh, maybe quality control um, uh, in the hand of uh, the operator, we are really interested in the handheld snapshot cameras. And that's why we, we have been uh, commenting with uh, IMEC uh, about their new uh, developments. Uh, because uh, I, I think that we, we can do something uh, in relation to the, the new hyperspectral, uh, hyperspectral camera, the short wave range. Again, I'm talking about the short wave because obviously a visible and near infrared could be interesting, but the amount of, of available information uh, is rather limited. Uh, the, the, the information available, available in the short wave uh, infrared uh, range is 
really huge, as the uh, IMEC uh, colleague uh, commented uh, previously. And uh, the, currently, the limitation is basically uh, what I described in my, my slide. So, and in relation to what uh, can you do for us? Okay, well, we are continuously, uh, first of all, we are continuously evangelizing about the, the advantage to, um, uh, to, to use uh, half spectral imaging among our clients and our partners. But obviously, we are continuously exploring, looking for partnerships, uh, according to a win win formula, obviously. Uh, not only with the manufacturers of the cameras, obviously, but also with um, people in the photonic uh, sector uh, in touch with the market, um, because we are clearly interested in widening uh, our market possibilities with new challenges, with new compatible compatible applications. And in some cases, we, we find and non-feasible <laughs> applications, okay? But in that case, I, I think with this, this meeting and the, with the dissemination of the, the information through the YouTube channel, um, we will gather a lot of uh, uh, new needs and opportunities. And uh, well, hopefully, hopefully we will uh, be able to address these uh, new needs with your contribution. Thank okay, you thank you very much. much. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Muchas, muchas gracias. Fantastic presentation. Great, great company. I think we already have a question of one of your future partners, customers. Fred, you have a question for Alejandro, right? Okay. Let me unmute you. Yes, Fred. Yeah, okay, I'll unmute. Now, I was uh, interested in how do you do the elimination of this uh, HPR system for, um, for S SWR IR um, wavelengths? How do you yeah. get enough light? Yes, uh, illumination. This is <laughs> this is a critical problem. Yeah. Uh, we are using halogens, halogens uh, lamps. Okay? Uh, okay, there is no magic about that. We have been testing different solutions, but uh, uh, even in the visible, even in the visible, we have uh, seen that the uh, LEDs uh, based solutions are not uh, strong enough. Okay, for for compensating what you mentioned before in your presentation, yeah. the lack of uh, well, the, the the need of having a good signal to noise uh, ratio. That's very important. Yep. Mainly mainly because, because we are working, you are working uh, with a very fast um, yep. case. Uh, so you need to decrease the interaction time a lot in order to speed up the process. And with a low, low uh, charge interaction time, you need a lot of light for lighting. Okay. And so but you are also uh, stick uh, stuck to the to the halogen lighting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the, it's, Unfortunately, I don't have any, <laughs> any other <laughs> solution okay. uh, currently right. for you. Okay, just putting I a lot of. They don't stop. They don't stop the production of it. Yeah, yeah. that's something. Yeah. What, what's what worrying us? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you. We are more or less in the, with the same uh, pain. Yeah. <laughs> Alejandro, welcome to Epic. You are really epic. You have the, the, the energy and the smile of the epic people. Let me introduce you to one of my epic friends. All okay. the way in Paris, uh, Imagine Optic, Marshall. You should know that Alejandro and Iris is a key company assembling consortia and getting projects through collaborations. So this they are truly unique. And uh, could you tell Alejandro, but also all the rest, what uh, Imagine Optic uh, does and what, what they can do for us? Hello to everybody. Uh, Hello. Yes, I'm there today to just to have a, a look at, at the market uh, for uh, hyperspectral, but also, yes, we, we have some issues, uh, coming issues with cameras. So that, that's a good point also. So we, we would like also to maybe to, to uh, enter to this market one day. Yeah, that, that's a good experience uh, today for me. Uh, what we are doing at Image Optics is uh, we are making some uh, uh, wave front uh, sensors, which means that we, we analyze uh, the, the light coming from uh, whatever the, the source uh, or the, the reflection somewhere, and we analyze this, this front on the, the, the front of the, of the light coming. So we can detect uh, yeah, different kind of uh, surfaces, etc. So it's maybe complementary to, to, uh, to, uh, to a detection you, you are using for sorting, for example, or, or mm -hmm. detecting or or characterizing uh, quality of surfaces, etc. So, so th this is uh, some, uh, yeah, some complementary or maybe dif different or maybe the same, uh, the same application. In fact, uh, that we want to to select or uh, clarify uh, goods or, or things like that. 
Uh, Alejandro, your presentation also got quite a lot of impact in the internet. I have Thierry Vertu, a friend of mine from Cilios. Uh, hi, hi, Thierry. He's hi, saying hi. That, that he expects to have a, the camera that you need, a multispectral s weird camera, a snapshot multispectral s weird camera, uh, very soon. Uh, and he wants to talk to you. So this is a, already a good connection. I also want you to meet my friend from Photon Lines. Uh, how are you today? Could you, thank you very much for joining this afternoon. Maybe you can tell us a bit what Photon Lines is and also what kind of collaborations, connections would you like to do today? Yeah, thank you, Rosie. I'm quite happy to be here. You know, actually, you know, Photon Lines is more a distribution company. Uh, during the different presentations, for instance, you know, I mentioned, uh, I have seen uh, Lambda X or VTT, which are you know, potential uh, partner for a company like Photon Lines. But if you give me a, a few a few more minutes, I would like you know maybe to explain that uh, we are not only a distribution company. We are a, what we call the added value distribution company, and we are doing something uh, uh, a little bit like uh, Iris is, is doing in very small uh, part, I would say. For instance, you know uh, we we develop our own uh, um, software platforms. To make uh, the acquisitions control on different cameras of, of our partners, and recently, you know, we develop um, a plugin, you know, to uh, to uh, make uh, some uh, image acquisitions from a hyperspectral camera, and also, you know, the possibility to make uh, calibrations to provide the solutions, you know, to the customers. Uh, recently, just to give you uh, um, uh, typical applications. Uh, we, we, we develop a, a system to uh, detect at the early stage uh, disease on the uh, uh, on, on wine. I mean, uh, the, on the uh, winery, you know, on, on the lift of uh, the, uh, the, the, the winery. So we can detect uh, disease like uh, oidium or mildews uh, using, you know, this kind of um, uh, hyperspectral technology and it works. And, um, we probably you know will have uh, a product uh, coming soon that will be uh, applied directly on, on, on the field. So just to give you an, an, an illustrations of what we are doing. Eric, you're a great guy and the distribution with added value is something that has inspired us a lot. And I, I had a, a coffee with you a few years ago in Paris and we had a nice conversation. We ended up in an article that got a lot of impact in the in the community. Distribution without the value is really the future. Let's move on with the program. Let's go all the way to Cenix and let's go to my friend Mark. Thank you very much for being with us today. Tell us how we can help you and you can help us. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Jose. You hear me? You hear you, we see you, we don't see your slides yet. So no, so I will, uh, okay. Use the delicate touch of which works. That's it. Yes. It's okay? Yes, go full screen, uh, presentation yeah, yeah. mode. Hold on a second. That's what I tried to do. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Go on. So thank you very much, Jose. Thank you for inviting me in this very, very interesting uh, meeting. So um, I'm Mr. Mark Larry, and I'm strategic marketing manager for Xenix company. So today I will uh, talk about what we are doing uh, for hyperspectral imaging. So first of all, some word about Xenix activities. So uh, at Xenix, we are manufacturing infrared cameras. Uh, from uh, short wave, mid wave, long wave. And uh, we manufacture the camera for a different kind of market. So safety, security, transport, medical, science and research, and a lot of industrial process monitoring and machine vision. So in fact, the hyperstructural is really a big underlying technology driver for this kind of, uh, of market. And uh, in Xenix, we are focused on the um, hyperspectral uh, application and technology for, uh, let's say, a long time now. And we, we know uh, we, we are quite comfortable with it. So we, we make some product for this. Um, 
So in, uh, especially in short wave, we are vertically integrated. That means we uh, design the sensor, the core, and the camera. So that means we can deliver uh, the level which is uh, re required by the, by the application, by the customer. It could be at the sensor, at the core, or at the full camera, okay? And we continue for sure, we have continue research and development to uh, uh, grade uh, the, the performance of, uh, of our product. And we are also developing every, every days, I would say, a new product. So in terms of hyperspectral and also multispectral, which uh, it's quite close, let's say, uh, we already have some uh, current product in our portfolio that are used for hyperspectral or multispectral imaging. Uh, so a, a, a way, because I heard people uh, saying, oh, uh, could it be interesting to have a, a simple system, a more simple si system, perhaps not uh, the, old, uh, the old wavelength, but some of them. Um, a, a good way to do that, uh, an easy way, is to use a line scan camera, uh, high-speed line scan, and then to multiplex the light with LED at specific wavelengths. Of course, you cannot get all the spectrum, but you can get the, the, the more relevant wavelength that you need. And in some cases, this is a, the good solution. Of course, you synchronize acquisition, you put it, on top of a mobile conveyor, and then you, be, you benefit on, let's say, an affordable ultra high resolution camera in short wave, because uh, the line scan we, we can uh, propose up to two thousand pixel per line, and then the other dimension you get the, the, the conveyor belt, so you can get uh, as much pixel as you want in a way. So uh, and you can get a high speed scanning. Uh, so um, with the 2000 pixel, you can use it on a, on a quite wide belt. So this is uh, a kind of application and uh, the, the kind of uh, product you, you, we, we provide for this kind of application, like scan camera. So we have the links and the, the, the mounts, which is quite new. It can run very, very fast. And we also propose some uh, 2D cameras, uh, 2D arrays. Uh, so in this case, it's um, more classical uh, uh, hyperspectral with push broom uh, for the spectral analyzer in one dimension uh, and, the, and the push broom in the other dim dimension. And then also you have the possibility to, to make it snapshot with uh, for the transform uh, system in front of it. So with this, we know that we work on uh, on this field and we propose product for this for a long time. So we we understand that the need is for low noise because you want uh, in hyperspectral uh, sometimes the, the, the signal you are looking or difference of signal you are looking are very small. But you also need a, a high dynamic range uh, because it's good to to have part uh, the, the small signal, but you don't want to saturate on another peak or reverse. It's interesting to have the big peak, but if you miss the small one, you have trouble. So high dynamic range is, is a big demand and also a high speed because you want to, to run quite, quite fast because you, you like to have an hyperspectral real time. So that's a challenge. And we have some product and the last one, uh, we, it's a camera that we released this year, earlier. It's called the Wildcat, it's in short wave, dot nine to 1.7 micron, can run at 200 Hertz. Uh, it's a VGA format. I know people want the ultra high resolution, uh, but okay, for the moment, the VGA format, uh, high sensitivity, let's say it's state of the art. Uh, it's very low noise and very high dynamic. Uh, so it's typically the kind of product that can be used and, and are used for hyperspectral imaging. So that means we are we already have in our portfolio the kind of camera that could uh, could fit the need and appropriate uh, for this kind of uh, application. So the question is, what's next? In fact, and um, we need to, to to identify the next steps. So 
for sure, we have planned for the future. We have planned in a wavelength extension because uh, people want either to extend from short wave to visible or higher wavelength than 1.7, go to 1.9 or 2.5. Um, they, there is also a, a possibility to adapt the, the kind of camera to the real need because there's let's say a standard camera, an industrial camera usually is a, a four, four by three format. It's VGA, QVGA, uh, yeah, SEGA and so on. Uh, but it might not be the, the good form factor. Perhaps you need only, uh, I don't know, uh, 20 line by, uh, by 300 uh, pixel or something like that. So, this is something that we are uh, thinking about. And there is also, uh, a, let's say, um, a strong uh, axis in, uh, in, in the reflection and uh, in development. It's uh, the, the cost reduction, uh, how to reduce the cost, because a lot of people ask for, yeah, we, we would like a high resolution. And I, I saw one of the comments, uh, soon it will be for free in your pocket. I'm not exactly for free, but everybody is trying to reduce the cost, definitely. <laughs> so um, in this way, uh, we are thinking about, uh, let's say, uh, uh, defining a joint specification for specific needs. That means for some needs, you need only part of the, uh, of the array. If there is a peak uh, and then nothing, and then another peak, you probably don't need all the array. So, probably some defective pixels are acceptable, providing that it does not fall just uh, on the signal you want to detect. So this is something that could be discussed. There is also a, a strong uh, way of uh, improving and reducing the cost in the embedded filters. Uh, a lot of people discuss about the, the filters. So that's something that could be interesting to put it directly inside the camera. And, and then also to add additional intelligence on the sensor and on the camera so that the, the global system is, uh, is cheaper, so that the, uh, and the camera is easier to, to use and provide more information so that the system manufacturer can concentrate on, on his, uh, his, let's say, his core business, his, uh, his main skill. And, and for sure, for, we cannot do that alone and uh, we need the feedback from the technical user and we need some business input as uh, people said uh, earlier uh, what we have to which kind of market we have to focus on in order to first answer this need which which could be a trigger for the rest so let's say we have planned for the future but we are uh, always and we need we are looking for cooperation with different partners that can help in developing this this new this new product. So, thank you. That's all for me. And these are my contacts. You can contact me. Thank you very much for a great presentation. No, sorry, you go, Francesca. <laughs> no, no, no worries. Sorry. Now, thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah, that, thank you for and sharing. So, um, the the question is so yeah, we want to have cheaper cameras, right? So that's why we have multiple, right? That's one of our aims. <laughs> so European funded initiatives are, so those of course not for the pilot line that drives uh, already well-known uh, structures, but for hyperspectral imaging that still needs development, do you think that the European funding project can actually, I mean, we heard Iris is committed also in many, uh, not only multiple as projects. So do you think, Mark, that uh, this is possible, uh, it's a good way to go, that uh, also companies are committed in uh, in European activities? Yeah, definitely. Uh, European project, European activities are, are a good way to, to make uh, partnership and joint development, definitely. Uh, this, this is, let's say, the, um, the, 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 let's say the, the upper side. And, and then after, in order to, to bring it really to the, to the market, we need people, we need, we need EPIC. To let's say to to uh, to partnership to to contact the different kind of expert on uh, either uh, scientific expert either company that are expert in their field to build 
the, the let's say the partnership to really develop the right the right product and to 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 drive us okay you, you it's better if you can do that and perhaps we can help you we have the filter okay you want to a filter inside is a good idea okay we can we have the filter this this is a, we need this kind of perspective i see that you have something it's not if you just tune that way then go so and and at the system level oh perhaps some people they didn't know that we have already some kind of camera that could feed them in so this is really a good way of cooperation yeah mark you're hired in the case you miss you miss your job you are hired at epic <laughs> for advertising <laughs> exactly <laughs> what well, I epic... just joined Zenith, so... <laughs> no no because you Give said exactly <laughs> You said exactly what we are doing. So we also join European initiatives because we love photonics and photonic technology. And so that's why we are there and we want exactly to engage and, and bring really products to market and not only leave them in some lab or in some prototyping phase. So very, very, really, really precise. Thank you very much for, for pointing this out for us. Then I, I don't see other questions. Is it the case or am I only blind? Because in the case there are none, I know that Herman from Spectrogon. Ah, okay. First, let's talk Herman. Yeah, Herman. <laughs> Hi. So, do you like? Would you like maybe to 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 tell us why did you attend this meeting? How even you can almost you saw almost all of them. Uh, the speakers. Who is a potential uh, collaborator for you, and what can you do for them? Well, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Herman from Spectragon in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, we are a coating company and we're supplying uh, optical coatings from the base near up to the far infrared. And of course, today we've heard a lot of uh, applications in the near uh, visible and three range. And uh, we also know that there are several suppliers in this wavelength region. And what we are, what I'm interested in, what we are interested in looking at. Uh, what are the potential collaborations, perhaps in longer wavelengths, uh, since we have uh, capabilities of doing coatings, filters uh, on direct on directly on detectors, on wafers, on substrates, uh, on MEMS. So uh, this is what we are looking for to say that okay, uh, here we are. We can do uh, different kind of uh, coatings for you. I hope you will contact us if there's something you need. Good, very good. I guess uh, this is uh, also a good address to go. And then um, I don't know if John had a question. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Mark, Mark mentioned uh, embedded filters, uh, further, further development. What, could you could you elaborate a bit on that? What do you mean by the embedded filters? Do you mean coated directly on the wafer or just in general inside the system? So uh, I, I'm not a technical expert, so I cannot tell you whether it's better to put it directly coded on the on the detector or to put as, uh, as uh, something presented before on a separate uh, wafer. But let's say the idea is uh, to provide um, uh, pre-processed information to the system. Understand. Uh, my understanding, uh, I'm in the photonic uh, and the optronic for, let's say, uh, more than 20 years now. And uh, the closest, this kind of function, the closest you can put from the sensor, usually the better it is or the, sim the more simple, the most simple it is at the system level. So if uh, instead of putting a, a big system in front, we can put it inside and that the, the system manufacturer will use the output in the same way and process the data in the same way that it did, then it could simplify. That's, that's just, uh, just an idea. I mean, but it's, so the way it has to be done, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the best way and the cheapest one because it's also a part of cost reduction. So it's always a trade-off. But uh, that, that's the idea of embedded feature. Embedded at the camera, minimum, if it can be embedded in, uh, in the detector. Why? Why not? Yeah, I think so at the end of the day, it's uh, you can code it on the wafer. Uh, there are some advantages to, to do it on a separate piece of glass, like, like uh, Oliver from Delta also mentioned. And <clears throat> when you 
when, when it comes to filter performance, so if we look at multispectral, where I pick up to six wavelengths, I can do really nice filters with thin thin coating, right? And then you'll, you'll get your really precise data uh, cut off precisely where you want. Then when you go, when you go to variable filters, uh, especially at the bottom, they start to spread out and overlap. And, and I think that, that, that's what the, the system designer has to decide, what, what do I need? And also when you do discrete filters for multispectral, you have to uh, you, you pattern them. So you have additional processing. It's not just a coating process, it's also patterning, like uh, similar to, I think EMAC definitely uses uh, something like that and which, which adds additional cost. So it's really, I mean, there are many, many uh, variants to do it. And, and uh, I think uh, as many people said already in the session or in every epic session, there's just the, the, the discussion is needed among the different disciplines to sort of optimize them, each component, not just the filter. To, yeah, to match that. exactly. 100% One, agree with you. Yeah, and we are here to involve all the, all the stakeholders that they can help you in this. So to follow all the steps of uh, not only filters, but anything that is possible to improve the technology and make it cheaper. <laughs> so now before Ross uh, is forgetting that he has a slot as well, we should go on with the agenda. And so finally is the, the, the time for NKT Photonics. So Ross, please. Now thank, is your thank turn. You, Francesca. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks Epic for, for bringing us all together. It's been really interesting. Um, share my screen. To presentation. So want, hopefully everyone yes. can see that. Um, very good. <laughs> so very brief introduction. I'm Ross Hodder with uh, NKT Photonics. Um, for those who don't know us, we're we're really a laser manufacturer. Um, we deal in everything from industrial lasers uh, for material processing through to temperature sensors and sensing lasers. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about today is um, kind of special product product that that's available uh, that's starting to get some traction in some hyperspectral applications, and that's uh, white light lasers. Uh, so um, for those of you who don't know what a white light laser is and think that sounds even a bit strange, I'll uh, I'll try and explain very very quickly. So it's a fiber laser, a single frequency fiber laser, and uh, we spectrally broaden it in another piece of fiber. So the system is really just one long piece of fiber and the output looks a bit like that plot there. So we, we generate a, a broadband spectrum, typically from 400 nanometers of the visible out to two and a half microns. Um, we've got lots of these systems um, in 24 seven applications. So they're, they're completely maintenance free, uh, long lifetime for 24 seven applications. So what does the output look like? Well, the spectral properties look pretty much like a lamp. Um, and we cover this full UV visible sphere range. And the, the, the spectrum is pretty flat uh, relative to lamp sources, relative to LED sources. And it's also pretty stable, both um, on short term and long term. But this is the, the fun thing, which, which um, makes this source a bit different. Uh, it's got the beam properties of a laser. So it's collimated, it's a single mode beam at all of those wavelengths. And because we're generating this light out of uh, a really small piece of fiber, it's got really extreme brightness compared to, to pretty much any other broadband source. Okay, move on. So in hyperspectral then, um, uh, this slide kind of shows the kind of four ways to, to implement active lighting in in hyperspectral imaging. Um, and on the right here, we got the, the properties of, of these white light lasers. Now I've put tunability on there. They're, they're intrinsically broadband, but I think uh, we had a, a nice presentation about putting tunable filters in front of them to make them into a tunable source as well. So I put tunability there as a feature. Uh, so the most, um, most applications that we're involved with use, use these two. So you either scan the laser spot over, over a sample, or your um, object, and then you can um, disperse that spectrum onto a 1D array. Uh, so it's a nice cheap detector element, um, and you can get spatial resolution down to the diffraction limit because it's a laser beam. Um, if you want to go a bit faster, 
you can spread your laser beam into a line. Again, that line can be diffraction limited. It can be a few microns wide. And then you could use a line scan hyperspectral camera. And we've got one or two applications who do this. Uh, so they use a, a 2D um, array and then some sort of filtering on the laser to build up your, your spectral data cube. Um, in principle, you could do that, but um, it's a bit of a waste of the source. It's just a broadband lamp if you're using it for, for wide field imaging. So most of the applications are using either this point scan method or this line scan method, or maybe using it as a tunable source. Um, quick comparison then to, to what else is available if you want to do active illumination. Um, so LEDs are great, they're cheap, uh, they last a long time and they don't use much electricity, uh, but they're somewhat limited for hyperspectral in, uh, in the spectral range and they do have gaps, um, which is not convenient. So as uh, some of the other speakers have said, a really low cost way of covering a lot of wavelength with a lot of power is to use a halogen lamp. Um, so it's a, it's a very um, common solution in, in the food sorting applications that we're involved in. Um, they have a really short lifetime. And as, as I think some other people have mentioned, they, they use a lot of power. They generate, generate a lot of heat uh, and maybe not the most stable. And then you have laser sources, which um, give you the brightness and the power and the stability. But this is really a multi-spectral technique. It's, they're not truly broadband and you need a if you want more spectral information, you need to add more lasers to the system. So white light lasers sit um, offering a kind of different mix of these, of these features. So from the LEDs, it's, it's um, not quite as long lifetime, but it's you know, significantly long lifetime and low power consumption. Similar to the lamps, we've got a, a very wide spectral range and a reasonably high uh, power output. And then we have the brightness and the, the beam properties of a laser. So you can get this um, high spatial resolution from the illumination source. So it's great. So why doesn't everybody use these? Well, the main reason is the initial cost is, is a lot higher. So that's, that's where we are. Uh, you can also do um, some really fun additional things using some of the laser properties. Um, so the first two, um, the first thing you can do is you can add in some 3D imaging. And there's um, a couple of um, spectral techniques um, using um, broadband sources. So there's uh, optical coherence tomography or, or white light interferometry techniques. We have a customer actually using this to do thin film measurement in semiconductor. Um, and chromatic confocal, where you, you use the chromatic aberration of some lenses to smear out the focus to get depth information. Uh, the source is also technically a pulse source, so you can put time of flight in. Um, and we've got some research groups doing that for, um, for a military application. Uh, then you can use the very high brightness to uh, recover some information efficiently from the inside of materials. So you can do very efficient transmission spectroscopy or looking at scattering and diffusion, which is uh, more difficult to do with, with ambient illumination. And finally, uh, you can do some enhanced imaging techniques uh, like confocal imaging or fluorescence imaging, um, particularly in combination with uh, the point scanning technique. Uh, so just a very quick summary. So um, yeah, the, the light source is kind of a unique combination of very high brightness, uh, laser-like uh, beam properties and broadband. And so you get the option to get some of these um, uh, additional measurement possibilities um, into the measurement. And I think I've used my time, so I will stop. You use your time very, very smartly. And I look up to NKT. We already had a meeting at NKT Photonics all the way in Copenhagen on medical lasers. And we discussed there about the growing the growing market that you are seeing in the hyperspectral imaging sector. So you get the epic question today. What can you do for them? What can they do for you? Yeah, so I mean, the, the reason we find these these sort of meetings useful is is we come. We're in, in this market. We're an OEM supplier. We're not um, we're not a hyperspectral system supplier. Uh, so we we're part of the supply chain um, and we're towards the bottom. So we we need um, sensor and and camera and filter partners uh, to go to our end user customers. Um, so we've got some great end user customers who 
put everything together themselves. I uh, wish everyone could do that. Uh, but for everyone else, we need um, we need some of you you guys to to work with to find the right applications. We have uh, a question because you talk about tunability today, and we have a question from from Jofer IC. They are actually asking how fast how fast can you actually select wavelengths? Yeah, so uh, the fastest way that we use is to use acoustic-optic tunable filters, um, and there the the random access time is of the order of a few microseconds. Uh, so you can do then then your your scan speed obviously depends on your your, your range, uh, but you can certainly do sub millisecond useful scans for hyperspectral. I think we have had a fantastic meeting, had, had a great cooperation here. There's room for cooperations. Uh, and uh, Francesca, we did our best, our best moderating the event to make sure that you get the right light, the right spotlight, the right white light. But uh, now the ball is in your court. Now it's time for you to explore these connections. If you want to get in touch for people on YouTube and people in the room, if you want to get in touch with any of the speakers, just remember jose.pozo.epic.com. In my mind, while I was at the same time that I was uh, chairing the event and talking to all of you, I also was say was taking notes i love taking notes so these are my learnings of this meeting so on the first hand uh, one of the big challenges that we had today was really the cost and complexity of hyperspectral imaging cameras we talk about new cmos compatible approaches we talk about coating and filter depositions on cmos cam on cmos solutions and i think that was going into the right path we also talk a bit about the data challenge. I had a separate meeting with data companies to talk about that, but uh, we really see that this could be perhaps the, the, the biggest the biggest problem that we have in the future, but not, in, not today. Today we talk about resolution. And there I actually like very much the presentation from IMEC. They were talking about expanding the trend to extend to SWIR. And the reason for that is that we want to approve, we want to actually make use of the fact that there is absorption for certain materials that are the ones that our customers are looking at. And then the people were talking about different SWIR detectors and cool solutions. I think there, there is obviously a great, great uh, market. In addition, most of the users today and the system integrators in the room were talking about uh, the illumination, the active imaging, and we finished with uh, the presentation from NKT, where we're talking about, okay, we have a, a super continuing generation, the biggest challenge to make it affordable, but if we compare with the alternatives, so our LED, halogen lamp, I mean, this is not last century. I think we are now in the position of developing solutions that are stable and they have the right lifetime and the right spectral range. So for that, we all should make sure that this, have, that this super continuing generation goes into the right cost uh, that the users demand. Uh, we talk about wish list, and there the people were talking about, uh, especially the presentation from Iris. Alejandro was fantastic. He talked about uh, more than 1,000 pixels, uh, one millisecond per line with no illumination, handheld. It's the, I call it the Santa Claus Christmas list, but I think we are in the right path there. And Francisco was very good actually mapping this with the different EU initiatives for clinical trials in the medical. We have MedFab, looking at different demo cases. We have uh, multiple uh, trials actually to deploy uh, different demonstrators to use hyperspectral imaging in process control monitoring, and we had the presentation from Sexo on the CQSO uh, on the on the user side from the agriculture, and they talk about two challenges: cost and resolution. Uh, we do have uh, very clearly interest in the CMOS side, and their delta optical was fantastic, focusing on robustness, light efficiency and simultaneous 3D measurements. So you can see a lot of learning points, a very efficient meeting, lots of good connections. You guys are epic. Let's continue. Until the next time, continue like that. Stay home, stay healthy, and stay safe. The virus is almost over. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>